Hey folks, welcome to Junk Drawer number 10. We're back again. It's Tess's Corner. Oh, that's right, yes. I saw a disc in the sky. They went and ate at a parallel universe, Virginia yep, City. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. The first thing that went through my mind is, ah, oh, this can't be my infield monster. I was pretty sure I hit the guy at least once. Literally or figuratively. <laughs> but you know, we can do that here in the junk drawer because it's just family. Do you want to see my postcard of it? Hang on. I have some observations. That phrase tickled me a lot. <laughs> is it haunted? Uh, well, I think so, yeah. And on that note, Sarah, cue that closing silence. Astonishing Legends would like to thank Simply Safe, Quip, Mint Mobile, Wondrium, Squarespace, our contributors at Patreon.com, and you, our listeners, for making tonight's show possible. On our last show, we introduced you to the incomparable Mel Waters, if that is his real name, a man who called into Art Bell's venerated overnight paranormal radio show, Coast to Coast AM. Mel, a resident of Washington State, claimed that he had a bottomless pit on his land, and he wondered if anyone could help him figure out a good way to measure its depth. His story was not without its humor, and Mel was a charming guest to be sure. He definitely had local knowledge of the area he was calling in about, and there were aspects of his story that seemed very real. However, there were also parts of it that seemed far-fetched. Art Bell repeatedly asked him to swear he was telling the truth, and Mel repeatedly promised that he was. At first, this seemed like a relatively straightforward story, but after Mel appeared on Coast to Coast, things took a startling turn. His land was confiscated by an unknown branch of the military, who wholly and immediately restricted Mel's access to his own property. Mel detailed the scope of what was happening and shared information that indicated he had been essentially threatened with jail time on trumped-up charges if he didn't comply. On the other hand, it seemed that he was about to be made a financial offer that he couldn't refuse. Jail? Or millions of dollars? What would you do? It turns out that was only the beginning of this incredible story that just keeps getting weirder and weirder the longer it goes on. Tonight, we'll dive much further into Mel's hole, and frankly, we're not exactly sure what will happen. Welcome back to Astonishing Legends. I'm Scott Philbrook, and this is Forrest Burgess. The West is the kind of place where you can walk up to the edge of a tree line and feel like you're staring into another world. It's filled with equal parts wonder and danger. Brian Watkins, award-winning playwright and creator of the Amazon Prime series, Outer Range. Join us tonight for the final part of our special series on Mel's never-ending hole. And we're back. Oh, no echo this time? Nah, yeah, I'm over it. Oh, okay. Well, we are back, folks. A couple of very quick announcements here at the top of the show. Firstly, I want to thank everyone who responded when we put out a request for listener stories. We received over 70 voicemails and dozens of emails as well. It was an embarrassment of riches. It, it really was. There were so many great stories. Uh, we're pretty sure we're going to be making this a more regular feature. So we, we're only able to uh, use about three of them for this next episode that's coming up. But to those of you who sent them in, we may be calling you in the future for our Patreon show, The Astonishing Junk Drawer, or seeing if you might want to join us on YouTube to talk about them. Or both. Yes, exactly. So rest assured, we have them all cataloged. Don't be surprised if you hear from us about your story, even if it's not in our next episode. And on that note, we've made contact with the first three folks we'll be featuring. So if you haven't heard back from us, your story is in our archives now, and we may still be in touch. But we can't thank you enough for taking the time to send them in. We apologize if we don't get back to you directly about your submission, but rest assured, we've been through every single one of them, and we greatly enjoyed all of them. And on top of that, we will be, if you're if this is yeah. the first you're hearing of this, we'll be doing this again. So if you've got a crazy story, just hang on to yeah. it. We are going to start uh, soliciting these more often. Absolutely. Again, thank you from all of us at the team here. Your time is greatly appreciated and valuable to us, so thanks once again. And one more other major announcement. Our good friend Seth Breedlove over at Small Town Monsters has put together a Bigfoot-themed convention called Monster Fest for June 3rd, 2023 at the Doubletree by Hilton in downtown Canton, Ohio. And guess what? We're going! Uh, this will be a full-day event with vendors, 
artists, and guest speakers, and will actually be there doing a live podcast recording too. I'm not sure how that's going to go, but... Uh, I think it's going to go great. I, <laughs> okay, I just don't know why it had to be Ohio. It's the spookiest state in the nation. Oh, come on. Canton is a beautiful place. And, yes, uh, I We know. have uh, various out. connections to it. They make really good fudge there, I've heard. Well, who's not a fan of fudge? By the way, <laughs> uh, this is pretty much exactly a year from now, so there's plenty of time to think about it and get organized for it. Pre-sale tickets are available now at the Small Town Monsters website and their Facebook event page. There will also be tickets at the door. It's family friendly and children under 12 will be admitted free. So i um, going to have to lie about mm-hmm. my son's age. Mm-hmm. They're also premiering a new Small Town Monsters film the night before at the Canton Palace Theater. Tickets will be available for that through the theater's website. So check that out, folks. We'll have yeah. links in the show notes, of course. Yes, and we're really looking forward to this one, as not only are we going to be there, but so are our dear friends Richard Haddam and Jim Harold. It should be a blast. We do have one other thing to discuss, a warning about tonight's show. Later in the show, we're going to be retelling an anecdote that depicts animal cruelty. We do not obviously condone any kind of cruelty to animals, nor are we endorsing it. We're just retelling one of Mel's stories, and we wanted to make sure you were aware of this, though, because that's the sort of thing that might get you upset. You may want to skip that part of the show. We've left out some of the more violent details, but we still wanted to warn you. It's a story somewhat akin to what happened to the goat in the first Jurassic Park movie, if that helps at all. Mm. As of this recording, we're not exactly sure where it's falling in the show, but we will have a warning for it before it begins, and we will include the start and end point for that story in the show notes and description for tonight's show. Because by the time we post it, we will know where it's falling. So if you're looking for the specific time it appears, consult the show description or notes before you continue tonight. Yes, and this story is a somewhat infamous component of the legend of Mel Waters. So we elected to include it tonight. It's important to the finale, let's say. Yes. And there will be another warning shortly before that section begins. All right, finally, I want to give a very quick shout out to a friend of the show, Bill Richardson, to tonight. Uh, Bill, hang in there. We hope that you get well soon, sir. Yes, Bill, we're thinking about you, sir. Okay, let's dive back into Mel's hole. <sighs> now, where were we? Well, when we left our hero, we left him in an alley in a not in not such great shape, right? Well, we didn't. Uh, some shadowy authority figures, let's say, could be government, could be military. Yeah. Let me just say, Mel is speculating that it may not be regular government folks. Yeah. He doesn't know. Well, it's a big mystery. It could also all be made up. <laughs> it could, but it's a good part of the story. Like I said, it, you you leave room for doubt. You don't box yourself in or paint yourself into a corner with this kind of stuff. Right. So where Mel was left off by someone, some shadowy entity with some means, if we're going to go with a story, in a very seedy and dangerous San Francisco alley, somewhere uh, in one of the rough parts of town. And he doesn't know what happened. All we know is that he wakes up mostly because, let's say some inhabitants of that alley were trying to rouse him to get him to sing some Willie Nelson songs because as Mel describes himself, he says, yeah, I look a lot like Willie Nelson. So we can imagine probably the long gray ponytail. And I guess looking enough like him that, you know, of course they're, they're teasing him, I'm sure, but they were, yes. they were arousing him. And finally he, he's very groggy and he wakes up and he realizes, I don't know where I am. And he tries to get his bearings. He looks up and down the alley and he's in a bit of a state. So this is what happened as a recap. And of course we're all used to recaps. If you're watching any kind of streaming show, every show has one because there's a lot going on and there's no less going on here. This could be a pretty good streaming series, I think. Yeah, it could. Absolutely. (laughs) <laughs> Mel had accepted the offer from the government to leave town. As Art said, uh, yeah, yeah, take the money and run. Good advice. And he was told to, as instructions, leave his car and wait at the rest stop outside of the town of Ellensburg. I'd guess off of I-90, which runs uh, south of the city limits, it seems. Then he was taken to the airport and then to San Francisco and then taken to Australia. That was kind of a dream that he hinted at he would like to take as an offer. Like, that'd be fine with him. He loves wombats. He's really into animal rescue, especially wombats, and research, but also herbs and plants. Yes. Indigenous herbs and plants for medicinal purposes. Those are his interests. And if the government's going to take him anywhere where he's just way out of the scene, way out of the picture, you want me to stay out? That's fine. Ship me halfway across the globe. And that's where he chose they agreed to. So... They arranged so he could bring his two dogs with him. 
and some of the indigenous plants. And as he says, if you know anything about traveling to Australia or really any island, Hawaii is the same way. They're not too keen on just popping up with your your pets and your plants. Yeah. They have to be very careful about that. Australia is no different. So he said, well, again, if you go with the story that they waved them on through, fine. Just take your dogs, take your plants. It's all set up. And he said, yeah, it was all set up. Uh, the payments were coming through. Those were showing up in his bank account. They were delivering as promised. Just an important note here. I think we all know that super, super famous case between Johnny Depp and Amber Heard that was not so recently in the news when mm-hmm. their dogs went to Australia in 2015 and Australia <laughs> threatened to have them put down. Right. That, I bet y'all thought I was going to talk about a different case just then. But yeah, oh, that's how serious no. they are about the dogs yeah. coming over there. And Hawaii's the same way. I know because I've traveled to Hawaii and I wanted to take my dog. And I, I, I can't remember mm. how long the quarantine was. I think it was at least 30 days. Might have been longer. Anyway, folks, that's the arrangement. And guess what? As he says, you know, of course, you can imagine there's complex paperwork involved. But he said it was already set up. They can make that happen if they want to. And just as a little aside, if you don't believe that people who are deemed important in our society aren't treated a little bit better, well, I was working on a automotive dealer show where the international president of a major Japanese automotive brand was going to give a speech, and then they had another event to go to in Germany, like the next day. And right after the speech, they were escorted directly to the airport, didn't have to go through customs, got nothing checked, got on a G6 or whatever they take, and went straight to their destination. So when you're that important and you have people clearing the way for you, those things can happen. Yes. Except on 9-11, when no one was getting anywhere, including that guy, because that was actually the day of the show. (laughs) That was my 9-11 story. Even he was not getting anywhere directly. No flights at all out of Vegas. So to Mel's point of view, it's like, well, uh, everything's all set up. It was a piece of cake. There, of course, was some cooperation on the part of the Australian government. But as far as he knew, well, the money's there. The flight's there. They they want me out of the way. That's fine. Do your thing. I'm going to go do mine. Now, so far, so good, right? Well, not completely. For reasons that aren't entirely clear based on all Mm. his interviews, he does decide to come back to the United States. He says, well, he misses his family. He wanted to get back. But there were other more complex things going on, I think, with his finances and the land and his ex-wife, who he had a reportedly amicable relationship with. But she, in fact, technically was the owner of the land that the hole was on, that, and he was apparently leasing it. But there may have been something going on with his finances. He wanted to come back to the United States. He missed his family and uh, other folks, I suppose. And so he came back to the U.S., and he had informed Art that he was ready to come back on the show. He'd been gone a couple of years, and he thought it'd be mm-hmm. fun to come back on the show. At this point, the story, the original story, had really blown up. And if you believe the setup here, the U.S. government was willing to give Mel essentially $3 million a year for the use of the property. And and he had to sign an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement, uh, for certain aspects of it. And he does tell Art, like, well, I can only disclose as much as I can. But there's also a lot I don't know about what they're doing on the property. He just took off. And there's a lot of mysteries. If he's setting us up here for uh, a big leg pull, then he's seeding it just right. Because he doesn't say, I saw anything weird. He just says, well... Yeah, the dogs wouldn't go near it, as you might recall. Birds apparently wouldn't sit on it. But I don't know about any other weird stuff. He said, I didn't see any black beam. I didn't see any zombie dogs. He's just saying that's what people have told him. That's how he's setting it up. And all you can say is like, well, look, the only thing that was I noticed that was weird is that it never filled up. And I don't think I could reach the bottom. Now, he also admits, yeah, maybe the weight of the line itself, uh, which he calculated at a at about 17 to 18 pounds at 80,000 feet of line, about 15.1 miles of line, maybe that was enough to make the tension on the monofilament seem like it's not hitting bottom. He didn't know. He just knew how much line he put in. Yeah. Another misconception is that that doesn't mean it's 80,000 feet deep. He just says, that's how much line I put in. Right. And he's very careful to say what he doesn't know about it. It starts off like, this is what I love about this story. It starts off like, okay, that's kind of weird. Maybe he's just misinterpreting, like, like we said, maybe it's just spooled up. 
you know, in a big root yeah. uh, down below. And it's just the line's heavy enough that it just seems like it's bottomless. And maybe all that trash and junk that people threw in wasn't as much as people thought. It did occur to me that if Mel's hole isn't exactly <laughs> straight uh-huh. deep, if it's got some bends in it or right. something... Right. In theory, you could see where something might be thrown into it and mm-hmm. bounce and deflect. And when by the time it hits the bottom, it's not directly below the entrance. Mm-hmm. And maybe the sound wouldn't carry back up. Maybe it falls into a larger cavern. You know, we know that I mean, what little I know about um, oil and gas sound pockets and, and underwater right. lakes and whatever. There could be a huge cave that it falls into right. that's filled with liquid or of some yeah. kind. Yeah, I mean, and maybe the sound wouldn't carry back up. It's plausible. I leave a lot of room for acoustic anomalies with something. When I when things come to what I call extreme physics, yes, a very long, deep hole, weird stuff happens, and maybe he just didn't hear it, or it didn't seem like he did. Right, and if it had a bend to it, maybe that fits in with the lava tube theory. Right. Right. So who knows? But he's very careful to say what he doesn't know. He's essentially saying he's looking for answers now. It seems, if you go along with Mel's story, that uh, there is something to the value, uh, Mel's million-dollar hole, in that now the government is really interested in this. And to Art Bell's point, you can take the money and run and continue with working with herbs. And Mel says he thinks that maybe the herbs he was working with locally there benefited, possibly, by being grown near the hole. Now, keep this in mind. He's working the land. He's he's digging up dirt. He's growing some plants that are non-native. They're not invasive species. They're just non-native to uh, central Washington. But he's having some success, and he is also breaking down the plants. So he's got a trailer there where he's working with these herbs, but he's going to have to leave all that. But he can continue all this in Australia and have some decent money to work with. And it, it sounds too good to be true. Yeah, $3 million a year, that folks, that's a quarter million dollars a month. $250,000 yes. a month that he was making, in theory, from leasing the land that really that his ex-wife owned. Leasing the right. land to this military organization or whoever it was during this time. He was gone around two years, as best we can tell, which is $6 million at that point that he's taking to Australia. Yeah, if it was continuous. And, uh he spent most of that money rescuing wombats, which was a big concern <laughs> at this time. Yeah. I, I actually remember it being in the news when I was younger. Right. And I guess he built a large facility or had, you know, contributed a lot to saving <laughs> wombats. Yeah. But at this point, for reasons that we'll try to elucidate as much as we can coming forward, he is coming back to the States. He's called Art. He said he's going to come back on the show. Right. Art does a little publicity, says, hey... Mel Waters, can you believe it? Mel's whole. He's been in Australia these past couple of years. He's coming back. He's going to be on the show on such and such a date. I mm-hmm. can't remember when it was. 2000, I think. it was. I know it was prior to 9-11. Yeah, he said that. it was uh, right before his return in later interviews as, we'll, as we go along the chain of events here towards the millennium. So right. it may have been close to... Yeah, uh, I think it was in, December 1999, I, yes. I believe, reading that now. So may have uh, rolled over into 2000. But the day Mel was supposed to appear on the show, he was going to help his nephew move from his apartment in Tacoma to the Olympia area. So he's very close to his nephew, as as we'll see. And if you could dig into that and and find him, you could make a connection to... Mel through his nephew, but he's also protecting his identity. They rent this U-Haul truck, he gets them moved, and then Mel was going to return the moving van and then take the bus back down to Olympia. That's exactly right. So he had, he's moving his nephew from Tacoma to Olympia, but the truck has to go back to Tacoma. So he takes the truck back to Tacoma, and now he's in Tacoma with having dropped off the rental truck, and he needs to get back to Olympia where he is living at this time. Right. And for folks who didn't know, I had to look this up for us. You probably knew because you're from the region. This is Mm. about 30 miles. It's not a long way. These two towns are not very far apart. No, no. But you you need a bus ride. Yeah, short bus ride. So there's there are buses that are running back and forth, just like buses that run in and out of New York all over the place. And so he gets on this bus in Tacoma, and as it's leaving, there is a fight on the bus of some kind, not involving him. He just describes it as an altercation. Right. But it's enough of a thing that the bus actually pulled over. And I had to look this up. It pulled over at the Fife Park and Ride. I was like, and I, I couldn't quite understand. But I, Fife, uh-huh. F-I-F-E, there is yes. a park and ride. Still there to this day. He yeah. said it pulled over there. 
And I guess they took everyone off the bus for this investigation into what exactly happened, including him. Yes. And this, for me, is where it starts to seem like, was that staged? Well, that's the that's the whole thing. Because they pulled into the, uh, I think it's Highway 512 Park and Ride. And there's a reason to pull over to the park and ride in that there's an altercation. Now, something interesting that Mel says is that, well, maybe it's a challenge to verify this. There's other passengers on the bus. And he says like, hey, if anybody was on that bus and remembers that, you could call in. And Mel said that himself right yes. on the uh, on the show. Right. So there's now a reason to pull over. And of course, they get met with transit authority people, local police. They escort everybody off the bus. And Mel says, well, we need to talk to you about what happened. And Mel says, well, I, you know, there was a kerfuffle. I'm not really involved. I need to get back to Tacoma. Yeah. And they said, don't worry about it. No problem. Uh, we have a transit bus here. You just tell us what we need to know, and then we'll take you back to Olympia. And that's the last thing he remembers. Yep, that's it. And then he woke up, as we said, in an alley in San Francisco 12 <laughs> days later, 12 days after he was supposed to appear yeah. on yeah. Coast to Coast. With Art. Right. Art just thought he flaked or something happened and didn't right. really give it much thought. Of course, that happens a lot with certain guests. And he was a little, uh, I think, on the fence and having fun with the story anyway. It's like, okay, well, he's he's back and uh, maybe something happened. But he didn't know because there was just no callback. He thought he got ghosted. So Mel is coming out of a fog, uh, almost a hangover of some sort, but he doesn't know from what, to hearing these probably drunk or possibly high folks standing around him in an alley trying to get him to <laughs> sing on the road again. Mm -hmm. And that's what he woke up to. And he doesn't really know how he got there. And he's feeling around, he's checking his clothes, his ID is gone, his wallet is gone, his keys are gone, he's wearing the same clothes he moved his nephew in, and he's filthy from yeah, moving right. and, and tired. And then he realizes while he's trying to take all this in and ascertain the situation, that on top of that, he can taste blood in his mouth. Mm -hmm. And he's like, what is that? You know that. Everybody knows that taste. And he realizes that all of his back teeth are gone. His molars. Molars, yep. wisdom teeth, everything gone. And he, he has no idea what's going on. And he said, then he, then he rolled up or pulled up his sleeve. He looks down and he can see where there was an IV in his arm. And it's got that sticky residue from where the tape was holding the IV in. Yep. If you ever removed a Band-Aid, you know what I'm talking about, is that there, there's that little uh, line of uh, lint around that. And he can see a little puncture hole on the inside of his elbow. And yeah. he his brain's pretty foggy. And then he wonders... Yeah, what just happened? No identification, no wallet, no keys, no money, nothing, and no back teeth. He's also missing his custom belt buckle that he made for himself. The thing about this is like, it's all right. So the teeth are gone. Art Bell actually makes a joke about this. He's like, your belt buckle, he's like, taking somebody's teeth, that's one thing, but taking a man's <laughs> belt buckle, you know, and, it, and it's yeah. true. And it was this custom one that he had made because he calls himself, and I quote, an itinerant mm -hmm. jeweler. Yeah. And so he would he would make things, do some metal work. He used to tumble stones and he had made this belt buckle uh, himself. He had made like 10 of them and he had sold them in the Ellensburg area, but this one was his and it was gone and he had no idea where it was or why it was gone. And once he figured out where he was, he managed to get in touch with his nephew and he, and he got his nephew to buy him a Greyhound ticket to pick up over at the bus station in San Francisco and bring him back to Olympia. So then I guess the question becomes, what happened? He doesn't mm -hmm. really know what's happened. Art and him are talking. Art is like, I feel bad. I promoted the show. And you, you basically got kidnapped and tortured and you don't even remember it. And here was something that I thought was interesting because at this point, Mel kind of intimated that he didn't think that the hole or being on coast to coast was necessarily the reason. And in fact, I have to look back. I had some notes here about what he said. I don't believe it was because of that, because there's a lot of things that I was doing. Mm. And it's like, okay, so what's Mel saying here? What else is Mel into <laughs> that could have caused this kind of scenario if it's not related to the bottomless pit that he was renting to the government for $3 million a year? Okay, first of all, let's not cast aspersions on poor Mel here. I'm not, I'm just, not. he said it himself. <laughs> a lot of things that I was doing. So for you folks out there listening, Mel has always said, look, it's not hallucinogenic plants. These aren't psychedelics. These are totally legal plants. With... I'm not even talking about that, by the way. You went there. Oh, no, no, I wasn't no. saying uh, anything about that. People say like, 
oh, so you were pretty close to having a drug lab there. And he said, well, no, right. no, no, listen, I got alcohol, I have some solvents, but, you know, they're properly taken care of. It was nothing, uh, you know, it's not a meth lab, okay? Let's cook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I do need to break down the, uh, the components of these plants and experiment with them. So that's what he was doing. He said, yeah, there's a few chemicals, but it wasn't anything dangerous or illegal, or I didn't need a permit for all that stuff. And, uh, right. but you could say like, oh, well, there you go, drug lab. And then everybody forgets about it. Like, oh, there you go. There's all crazy, you know, hippie Mel, uh, Willie Nelson Mel, and he's uh, experimenting with drugs and, and whatnot and make, making the LSDs. So that's an aspect of it. But he always claimed, like, look, I wasn't doing anything illegal. I'm just working with herbs and growing plants. And then the other stuff that you're talking about is when he talks about other stuff, it's like there's something bigger going on than just fascinating herbs with the great medicinal properties here. Now we're talking about, let's say, physics that the government would be interested in, and especially the military. That's part of his story here. That's the baseline. Is that what you were getting at as, as far as these other things? No, I wasn't getting at anything. All, the only thing I was getting at was that he said to Art, I don't think it's you, Art. I don't right. think it's about me coming on the show. I, it could be about something else. That's all I'm saying. Okay, okay. I'm not making any implications there, but I do think it's important to, I'm, I'm glad you recap that. Sure. We do want to talk about the medicine he was working with because I, I think we figured out what that was. And, yeah. and we'll get to that as we get to our conclusions here. But at this point, he'd been in Australia doing that. He came back. We don't even know if that was what he was up to at this point. Mm -hmm. He had just gotten back and was going on to talk to Art pretty close to after he came back to the U.S. So, And he didn't have access to that land anymore. So even yeah. if he was interested in those medicinal uh, herbs and that kind of stuff, it's unlikely that at that point he had an operation on that up and running anyway. Because I don't think he'd been back in the U.S. that long. Right. Now, as, as far as the teeth go, you start to rack your brain to make sense of any of this. And it's like, okay, if you're going to put this in part of the story here, what's the importance of the teeth? You and I were talking about a fun X-Files. A lot of fans out there will remember this one. But uh, it involved the the first formation of the Lone Gunman. Yes. The trio there. And they run into an agent who is, she's claiming that she's on the run. They're, they're tracking her down. They're not sure what to believe. Uh, in fact, uh, two of the guys think she's a government plant out to track them. The guy who was the former FCC agent is, is the one who is willing to give her the benefit of the doubt. Of course, there's a little romantic tension there, but they don't believe her. She comes back out of the bathroom having pulled one of her molars and there's an antenna in it. Right. That reminds me of, yeah, people with implants. It's like, and he explained Terry Lovelace's x-rays that he can show you yeah. That there's something weird in there with no incision marks. And then it's gone. And he's got those x-rays. So it's one of those head scratchers. But who knows? I thought maybe there was something in the minerals in his molars that was wanted by some authority to study later. I think it's just interrogation torture. And he doesn't remember the oh. questions. Oh, you're, so now you're talking uh, Zell from Marathon Man. Yeah, it, well, it's <laughs> what it seems like to me. They picked him up. I mean, they got the IV in him. They are numbing him. They, maybe it's truth serum, and they're mm. asking him questions about what he did in Australia or whatever else. Was he in Australia? We don't know. I mean, that's the other thing. It's pretty right. convenient to be halfway around the planet saving wombats. I mean, talk about something hard to confirm. <laughs> and then, you know, and, and then in the future, what we're going to hear is that the wombat sanctuary was torn down and disbanded. So right. it's like even harder to find out. There's a lot of convenience to those facts. Right. By the way, I'm not get, making my judgment now. I'm just looking at the big picture here. But to me, if you believe any of this at all right. and the teeth are out, I don't think the teeth necessarily had any cash value. To me, you take somebody's teeth out because you're messing with them and you want to know the answer to the question that you're asking them. We may never know, but it, yeah, you did make me think of uh, Dustin Hoffman. Yes. Yeah. Marathon is man. It, That's Is it safe? Together. Is it safe? Something bad has happened to Mel. Now, Art was believing that he was actually in Australia. This is a real yes. person, of course. This is not, yeah, this is not that's an AI true. Art did say that him. when he that he was communicating with him from Australia, it was yes. clear that he was in Australia during the communication that he was having with right. him. Right, and then he's coming back, and he doesn't show up. So that's where we're at now. But here's something else that was more important. There's another thing that was stolen off of Mel that is possibly much more... Uh, mind-blowing and important, and that was his belt buckle. That's what you're thinking. It's like, what? Who cares about this belt buckle? And there's another thing going on here, too, and that Mel found out when he got back that some legal action had been taken against him relating to the property. 
He's not great at describing these scenarios, which in a way eh. makes me believe him more yeah. because it's not a super buttoned up. The Maybe. thing that liars yeah. do is they bring lots and lots of extra intense details because they're trying to convince themselves of the lie they're sharing. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times with Mel, you go back, you listen to it over and over, and you still can't quite follow it. And it's not because it sounds like he's necessarily making it up. It's because it's a complicated reason, a complicated story, and he's just trying to relay it. And he, in some ways, is not great at imparting information. But one of the things that he says is that someone came along and looked at the property, his wife or whatever, and it, it had uh, now it had a septic system and paved roads and all these things that were not permitted or allowed. Mm -hmm. It was not supposed to have any improvements on it. And as a result, they were able to nullify his arrangement with his ex-wife regarding the property. And then essentially it was no longer his, which would also mean that the quarter million dollar a month rent would no longer be his either. Of right. some of that, he was paying apparently 25000 a month to his ex, who he said, he, he described that as an amicable relationship. He right. said, we were still friends. He said, we, something to the effect that we couldn't pull off a marriage, but we were friends. That's part of the divorce settlement. It's kind of scrub land in a way. I don't think she had any use. Yeah. For it didn't or, have a lot of value. Yeah. Didn't really want to work the land. He said, well, that's, you know, you like doing that stuff and you got your trailers up there and he wasn't violating any lease agreements before that. As he said, it was pretty worthless land. And his wife said, well, I'll, I'll give you that as part of the settlement here. And if you believe the character of Mel as a character, he's very generous. He's selfless. Uh, he loves animals. He's in the field of trying to help people with herbal medicines. And that's his nature. You and I were discussing this beforehand. Like, what's the purpose of that to take it away from him? Because I don't think it was the wife. I don't think she cared what was happening with the property. She's getting 25 grand a month. Now, maybe she changed her mind when that stopped, but I think here is that when he came back and there is a settlement against him that he has to give up the land, it's a convenient way to not have to pay him anymore. For whoever's paying him, whether right. it's, it's the government like, or whatever. Oh, well, you violated the lease. There's septic systems, paved roads here. Uh, there's other outbuildings you're not supposed to have on there. And he's like, well, I didn't do any of that. <laughs> it's like, no, we did it. And then we're also going to blame you for it and take the land away from you and have to stop and then we can stop paying you a lot of money. So if you go with the story, that's a maybe convenient workaround to end up giving Mel nothing. As Mel jokes with Art, it's a hole, but I got the shaft in the end. See, even Mel's making jokes about his own hole. But he also said that she kind of disappeared too at this point. So well, that's another he, thing there's too. There's a little bit, you know, Art says, is it possible that she's the one making the deal now? Because here's my question. Yeah. No matter how amicable they were, if it was really set up this way and he was getting 250000 a month, he's only giving her 10% of that at 25000 right? right? It's her land, technically. If it was my land and I was getting 10% of the well, lease on it, I might take some steps too. I'm just saying. So, or maybe she didn't know all that stuff was happening. Did he call her and say, hey, you know, uh, the government came and yeah. um, they said they're going to give me, oh, you know what? Never mind. I'm just going to keep leasing <laughs> it. Talk to you later. So, you know, he goes to Australia. He's getting the quarter million. He's sending 25000 to her. He's gone. Word gets out. She's like, what's going on? She drives by. She's like, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. And then word gets out to her about the lease he's collecting somehow. Or maybe the people, the nefarious people mm -hmm, that have taken it mm -hmm. over, are driving them apart from each other, divide and conquer. Maybe they go to her and say, yeah, well, you know, we sent mail to Australia. We're paying them quarter million a month. Would, right. you, you know, would you take less? Because he shouldn't have put these roads in here. Uh, well, look. I, <laughs> There's a lot of ways that could have played out. That's all that's I'm saying. That's true. And As someone just, who was in a permit war for five years with the city of Los Angeles. I remember that. I, I can was tell right you. with you, yes. Yeah. Well, the, the, if you, as you know from people and human behavior, she doesn't want to start growing anything on the land herself. She has no interest in the land. That's part of the settlement. So I'm not sure if that was violated. It reverts to her again. Right. After Mel gives it up. Right. So if you want to get real conspiratorial about it, it might be a good way to uh, make her go away as well in some other fashion. If they're willing to disappear Mel for 12 days and take his teeth and his, his uh, belt buckle and <laughs> everything else. If you're going to do all that, why are you paying him in the first place? I mean, you send him to Australia. Right. Forking over $3 million a year of taxpayers' money or whoever's above black project budget. Right, right. Is only a teensy bit more difficult than disappearing somebody for real, especially when you have a bottomless pit at your disposal. I'm just saying. There's two things about that. One, they don't care how much they spend. It's not their money. It's your money. It's my money. Right. Secondly, this was already made public as 
Art will say, once you make it public, it's just like, well, if he disappears, uh, because people are already going to go search this out, as soon as that broadcast happened, that's what they did. And suddenly, uh, something nefarious happens, people start asking questions. And yeah, you can just choose to not answer that as a uh, government agency or corporation, what have you. But here, it's just like, pay him a certain amount, but after a while, we're done. It's not going to be in perpetuity. Right. So you paid him a little bit of money. Who knows what happened to the wife? All Mel will say is that she became impossible to find. Yeah. Now, here's somebody, you know, he will say about himself, it's like, yeah, I'm not an easy guy to find, yet people who are looking for me found me. Because Art asked him, it's like, well, do you do you feel like people are following you or do you feel in danger? He's like, well, no, no, but, you know, I've tried my best to remain hidden, and yet these folks still found me. So it's not exactly directly tracking, but they they know where he is. And Mel's wife, of course, everyone's got family, usually. You know, apparently his wife worked at Central Washington University in the geology department, but she just kind of disappeared herself, or at least he can't find her. And as you said earlier, it was mostly an amicable split. Like, they were still on good talking terms or whatever, but she just kind of goes away. So, one thing I want to mention before we move on is that Mel says a curious thing here, and that one month after this happened, the Heaven's Gate incident with Marshall Applewhite happened, if people want to remember that. So, some weird connection that, he doesn't go into this, but he said, uh, maybe there's a connection there. Something um, weirdly off-planet weird people being attracted to anomalies like this. Yeah, I thought that was a stretch. I felt like everybody was stretching on that one. On the <laughs> Well, there's no, he's just mentioning it. It's like, look, anything uh, you, you were talking about, uh, what were some of your way back, uh, this happened in 1997 kind of thing. Well, oh, I was Dolly, talking about- Dolly the Sheep. Yes, Dolly being cloned, yes. <laughs> right. They announced well, it on the same day that Mel called in. Yeah, the right. First For you call. folks that think uh, that was too much of a tangent and who cares about what happened in 1997, we found out later, and you'll be surprised, that sheep figure prominently in the story later on. Yes, they do. You know, crime is up here in Los Angeles, as it is everywhere else. And I've never been happier to know that I have a Simply Safe home security system in place. But late night intruders and porch pirates are not the only thing you have to worry about in your home. Yeah, as a house inspector once told me, a home is a system. Mm -hmm. And every aspect of that system has to be maintained because one weak link in it can cause a ton of expensive damage. Oh, yeah. You know, that's a great analogy. Uh, listen to this story from a Simply Safe customer named Terry. Terry was away for the weekend for her daughter's wedding. In the morning of the ceremony, she got a call from Simply Safe's 24-7 professional monitoring center, and they let her know that her system had detected water in her basement. And this is scary because in moments like this, time is critical. Even an inch of flooding can cause more than $25,000 in damages. Think about it. Of course, I'm glad my Simply Safe system is making sure my laptop doesn't get stolen, but $25,000 in damages from an inch of water is a far more expensive problem. Uh, thankfully, in Terry's case, Simply Safe had detected the water just moments after the leaking had started. So, from the wedding, Terry just called her neighbor and explained that Simply Safe had detected a leak, and her neighbor went over to her house and quickly turned the water off before the flooding got too bad. See, that's amazing. And and that's the whole relativity thing. Uh, sure, I don't want to get burglarized, but a little yeah. water can do ten times the financial damage a, a minor break-in might do anyway in the same amount of time. This is why Simply Safe is such a great system. It can protect you from all of it. It's a breeze to set up, too. I, I set mine up in just minutes, and you can customize the perfect system for your home in just a few minutes at simplysafe.com slash AL. So go today and claim a free indoor security camera plus 20% off with interactive monitoring. Go to simplysafe.com slash AL. That's simplysafe.com slash AL for a free indoor security camera plus 20% off with interactive monitoring. I had my six-month dental checkup last week, and I mean, no issues at all. Uh, for a second, they thought there might be a problem with one of my teeth, but a second x-ray pointed to that just being a glitch in the first image. Dang, man. What, what do you mean, like a bet sphere glitch? Well, anyway, that that's <laughs> awesome. Uh, so not only no cavities, but gums were all good in that stuff too? Yeah. And, and you know what? Honestly, Forrest, I got to think it has to be because uh, you and I both yeah. have been using a Quip electric toothbrush for a few years now. Yep. Just like 7 million other folks out there, mm -hmm. it's time Sonic Vibrations use 30-second pulses to let me know when to move to a different area of my mouth. So I'm getting the dentist-recommended two-minute cleaning every single time I brush my teeth. 
I'm also one of those folks that actually likes flossing and Quip's refillable floss string mm. is great because not only does it make it easy to floss, affordable refills for it help to reduce plastic waste, which the world is finally starting to pay attention to. Uh, yes, well, uh, as you get older, uh, the older folks will know that uh, I have to floss all the time. So, right. But I actually prefer the, the floss picks and they have a refillable version of the floss pick too. You can restring it over and over like a tiny little guitar. Uh, just one <laughs> floss pod, which it comes pre loaded with durable mint flavored string. I like that. And it replaces 180 single use disposable plastic picks. And on top of that, the Quip toothbrush comes with a multi-use travel cover that I love. Yeah, that's right. And reusable handles in lots of cool different colors. Plus you can now upgrade your Quip with a new smart motor to track and improve your brushing mm -hmm. with the free Quip app. You can earn amazing rewards like free refills, products, Target gift cards, and more. So as you can see, Quip is more than just an electric toothbrush. They've got everything you need to build a complete routine. Anti-cavity toothpaste, two ways to floss like we just mentioned, and even refillable mouthwash that's a four times concentrate. So that's good for you and the planet. Quip delivers brush heads, floss, toothpaste, mouthwash, and now even sugar-free, long-lasting mint gum mm. every three months from $5. Shipping is free, so you can save money and skip having to get to a store and deal with all that mess. With stylish and affordable electric brushes starting at just $25, you won't be paying through the teeth for better oral health. If you go to getquip.com slash legends right now, you'll get your first refill free. That's your first refill free at getquip.com slash legends. Spelled G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash legends. Quip, the good habits company. Hey, I'm Sammy from Tulsa, Oklahoma. And when I'm not fighting off the Oklahoma octopus, I'm listening to Astonishing Legends. Now back to the show. Now, another thing that we should, uh, we were going to talk about and we should do it right now is you'll see a lot of comments that people make. Well, it's super convenient and this is all baloney because he never gave out the exact address or the coordinates of the hole. And so uh, he should have done that. Well, think about it, folks. If you had done that, in fact, you know what? Call into Coast to Coast right now and tell people you got something pretty anomalous in your backyard and then give the address. Yeah. <laughs> and just see what happens. Just give it a test. See what happens. Does anybody show up that you don't want back in your backyard poking around? Yes, I know. That is all part of this mythology, if you want. Yeah, he can't give out the exact address, but also he's protected because it makes sense. You don't want to give coordinates out to the largest overnight radio audience in the U.S. at least and have a bunch of people who are really keen on this kind of legend tripping kind of stuff show up on your property uninvited. That's right. You don't want to do that, but he will, uh, we're going to talk about uh, some possible satellite pictures of his property. But at this point, yes, he did not give out the coordinates or the address, uh, just very generally saying it's about nine miles west of Ellensburg. Now, this is what we want to say, folks, do not go there. We yeah. do not condone trying to find this place or traveling in the region or at any time trespassing on private property. And you got to be careful on government property about what you do. Always check your local regulations and rules. And again, we did not send you there. So <laughs> that was, well, that's what people do. They want to go see this place for themselves or they want to go try and find it. And just think if uh, you're traipsing around out there and this is an actual hole, let's just say an abandoned mine shaft, that's dangerous. Yeah, it can be life ending. You traipsing around mm -hmm. uh, in unfamiliar territory. And if you don't believe it, just take a look at the folks that died looking for uh, Forrest Finn's treasure, which was more than a that's few right. at that point. So it's dangerous. So yeah. um, there's always a point in some of these appearances, too, where Mel mentions the plant that he's dealing with, but he'll never mention it by name. I'm not really sure if that's a fear of a patent thing or whatever. We do think we know what that is. We are going to talk about it later, but he mentions how it helped with the uh, influenza, the Spanish flu, and that mm -hmm. it could have been a bigger help had it been more respected. So that is the primary herb that we think he is dealing with that is indigenous, I believe, to northern Nevada, but also he yes. was able to transplant it to Washington. Another thing about his latest appearance is we get a sense of his age. He mentions in this appearance that he was 68 years old or will be turning 68 in June. That would mean that Mel was born in 1934, if he's telling the truth here. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. Another thing, and I think we made an allusion to this in part one, is the reference to that gun that he found on the property. It was a a P-38, a German gun that he found. Walther, yes. Walther, P-38, that he found near or in the area of the hole. And one of the things he says is, especially if he's planting, he's turning a lot of dirt over, he would collect all kinds of things on the land there. And that was one of the things that he collected. And he couldn't really understand why this World War II era gun would be there, or at least that's what he thought it was. And I don't know a lot about guns, so if the P-38 was not present in World War II, don't talk to me about it, because I don't know. No, no. (laughs) No, it it was. You are correct. It was was produced by uh, the Walther Arms Company to replace the more expensive Luger. A lot of people will know, if you watched any World War II movies, you will have seen a Luger, uh, your son will know that from uh, Call of Duty if he plays the uh, World War II version. Yes. It's a very iconic gun. So this was produced to replace that, a little cheaper to mass produce and also in the same 9 millimeter parabellum caliber. So that's what he found. I think also the holster. Now, this is what's unusual yes. is that you know, Mel was saying you did find a lot of weird stuff on his property, like little knickknacks here and there. And he, he didn't really think much of it. He just collected it. And apparently this gun was in working order because he gave it. Uh, why don't you tell the story of uh, who he gave it to and what it did that was kind of weird? Well, he gave it as a deposit, uh, a security deposit on an apartment that he needed to move into. And apparently the person that had it, I, I can't, it's, I'm not fully clear on this. It was either yeah. the person or the guy's son was uh, talking about the gun and he wanted to get it back later because he later found out that that he, or at least he heard the story mm-hmm. that when this gun was fired, it fired and it worked and ejected a bullet, a projectile, but it didn't make any noise when you fired it. Yeah. Well, So imagine. how is that for <laughs> strange? And then let's take it one step further. Right. If you took this gun and you put it on a table or you got it near a radio, yeah. you would find that the radio would pick up strange... I guess programming, for lack of a better word, music right. from music from another time, or reports from geographically impossibly far away areas. Right. It could be a ball game from years ago, radio programs from the past, music from different eras, or something that uh, was too far away essentially to be picked up by any kind of radio, uh, unless it was right. shortwave. It had properties to it. Now this all starts to fit a theme that Mel's talking about with the hole and things being near it or around it or coming out of it, (laughs) that it has to do with audio or sound waves. There's something about the audio aspects of any object around this hole. And this is one of them. Now, people have said other objects, uh, you know, again, this is unverified because Mel never said this. And this might be part of the lore said by other people after or connected with this is that you could take a radio near the hole and it would do the same thing. It would broadcast programs from another era, or I don't think anything from the future, that's what's interesting, but it would be stuff that you shouldn't be picking up on that radio. But imagine if you could uh, just dunk a gun in there and suddenly it was silent, well, that would be very popular with the military and the criminal uh, faction organizations here. Yeah, and what's going on with that? Is it a paranormal anomaly? In addition to, in theory, being able to put it near radios and get different stations, he actually had heard that his uh, the gentleman who had the gun could wave his hands around and use that to control what signals were coming in. That's right. It's almost like a Walther P-38 theremin, is that you would uh, it would change the channel. It would You could change channels by waving uh, your arms. Is it uh, uh, some kind of uh, interference? Are you acting as an antenna? It's all part of the lore. So uh, in addition to this, there's he has he's telling another story about, if you don't know if you remember from part one, when we talked about there was a gentleman who would come and dump tires into the pit yes. on his land. And he had said that he wanted to get back in touch with him too, because he had been helping his son or grandson, he thought maybe, who had a truck that he was having issues with. And one of the problems he had was just in general traction. And for those of you who live out in the country or out in the West or whatever, you know that a lot of folks that have pickup trucks will put sandbags or some kind of weight in the bed to improve traction off-road or in bad weather. And Mel said that he gave uh, this young man buckets full of detritus that he had picked up around his property to help with his truck having traction. But he also took some of this kind of stuff apparently with him to Australia, which I can't really figure out why he would have done that, but he said that he did. And 
while he was in Australia, uh, in addition to working on Wombat Rescue, he was involved with ministries in the area, including the Ministry of Health. And one of the things that he was uh, dealing with there were folks that were in hospice. And some of them had advanced HIV. And he apparently took some of these things that he found on his land to them, and some of those folks were, as he said, no longer in hospice anymore, not on death's door anymore. So now Mel Waters is implying that things from around the hole on his land in Washington are curing people of HIV. Not everybody, just a few seem to be getting better. I mean, even one is an amazing thing. I'm just, sure. this is where I'm like, oh, Okay, where are we going here? So then, it, but this is only the beginning. Sure. It, it keeps getting crazier and crazier. We apologize if we've bored you so far, but hang on, hang on. It's going to get even freakier. So Art is like, why? I don't understand why you left. Why did you come back here? You had it so good, and he said, well, you know, I, did, I ran out of money, and I needed to come back, and I came to find out all these things had happened, and now his belt buckle's been stolen. And he said he was surprised to come back and find out there. It's, songs have been written about it. Drinks are named <laughs> after it. It's become this well, cultural phenomenon. No, you know what else happened? Pretty much uh, essentially the same region there where songs were composed, drinks concocted and imbibed is D.B. Cooper. Yes, that's right. That's right. South Central uh, Washington, they love their legends. And uh, this is a really one of the more enduring ones. Keep your ears peeled, folks, because there are elements of the story. Again, if it is fiction, it's uh, it's got some great sci-fi here to it in that let's take a, uh, a review here. It's a harmonic device of sorts or a sound dampening or amplification. It shoots black beams. It possibly has something to do with reviving animals that uh, get thrown into it. It's possibly a time machine or a vortex to another dimension or a parallel, let's say, world. So there's a lot going on here. D, all of the above. Are you surprised <laughs> that it has healing benefits, that some people got healed, not from the hole directly, but plants grow near it? Is this any crazier than what we've heard already? Well, stay tuned because you're going to have to make that decision yourself very shortly here. Well, one clarification there, Forrest, I don't think it was the, the implication, and it's hard to tell again mm -hmm. because he's not a super clear communicator. The yeah. implication from my notes and what he said to Art was that he was taking objects to these folks mm. that had HIV, not the plants. I don't think it was the medicine. He didn't really say one way or the other. That's a, an assumption on my part because he's working with healing herbs. Yeah, that would make more sense, frankly. What he's saying here to be clear is that he would collect a lot of uh, debris, as you said, uh, detritus, detritus, flotsam and jetsam, probably less flotsam, yeah. more jetsam. Yeah. The idea though is that there's a lot of just like bits of metal polished rocks. And again, these things interest him because he liked tinkering with jewelry and liked making things. He was very handy. He would polish stones, uh, rock tumble, and make jewelry. And so he was collecting stuff, but some of it he just gave to, like I said, the son of the guy, the tire guy. Yeah. But Mel's conclusion here is that everything that's near that hole has taken on some kind of odd property. And there's a bunch of stuff that ended up near the hole that shouldn't be there. And so everything that you get around that hole, uh, little metal ingots, screws, nuts, bolts, all this uh, debris that was found on his property as he's cultivating and digging and whatnot may have had special properties itself. So yes, you're absolutely right. It could be just the objects themselves that possess this uh, healing quality, shall we say. Yeah, there, and there's a point here at which Art stops and asks him, has he been back to the hole? And he says, no. He's in, and he's not mm -hmm. apparently not interested in going back. So it's at this point, this is in one of it getting near one of his appearances. He mentions an email address. And mm -hmm. I thought this was interesting. Again, this is another time capsule thing. He says that his email address is melwaters at home.com, H O M E dot com. Mm -hmm. I do remember when that was a proper email address right. that you could get. Yeah. It is now a completely different thing. Home.com probably right. went under a long time ago. So no point in using that one. But he spells it out. That means he's he's open to being contacted and he's Using that name, which I'm still think is either completely made up or a pseudonym for a real person. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of mm -hmm. details about him that seem very real. There's another point in this uh, interview, too, when he's wrapping up shortly after he gives out that email address, where he mentions that he's very, very anxious to get hold of a Hungarian man, a Hungarian Catholic priest. And 
Mm. It's never really clear to me anyway, and some folks out there who are male aficionados, maybe you have a clearer idea of why this particular character is important to him. I mean, it almost sounds like tradecraft, like he's going out on the radio and saying, <laughs> I need to reach the Hungarian Catholic priest, which is a code Ooh. for, okay, this means we uh, need to do a dead drop in downtown Tucson tomorrow afternoon. Right, like, I don't know right. what's happening there. That's <laughs> Why is he trying to reach this particular person, and why does he need to go on to coast to coast to get to him? Maybe there's more to Mel than we know about, or it's exactly what he described, or it's a great yarn. Yeah. <laughs> it's craftily, expertly spun. And I'm telling you, because we're still hooked to, we're still hooked to the end. And I was never more fascinated than I am now getting back into this when I understand more of the context and I'm older, you know, cause I did hear about this legend years ago yeah. and it's like, well, that's pretty weird. But then you don't know what to believe until you really dive down into it and you start to dispel some of the myths, which is what's happening here in the whole story itself. And that people are claiming stuff. It's like, yeah, but you really weren't there. And then people who were claimed they were there, were they really? Are any of these people real? Well, a few people associated with the whole are real. Now we know, of course, like I said, Mel is a real person, but why can't we find him? And if part of this is true, or he believes it is, then... Any one of these aspects, if it's true, makes this an outrageous and mind-blowing story. By the way, right now, if he's still with us, he's closing in on 88 years old or so. It's possible, but we'll see. Anyway, please continue. Yeah, so in, in these continued appearances, he goes on about how much money he had spent in Australia rescuing wombats, mm -hmm. which would have been millions of dollars that he spent on that. And then at some point, for some reason... That's not entirely clear. His facility was shut down, and all of his people that, I guess, worked for him were sent home. Yep. They were sent uh, emails, and everything was dismantled. Yep, severance checks, and they were sent on their way. Now, keep this in mind. Mel still had a way to contact these folks. Yeah. And they were experts. And Mel will say, first of all, that like, I, look, I'm not an expert in any of this. I'm not a veterinarian. I'm not a biologist. He's a bit of, uh, I guess, an autodidact when it comes to learning about herbs and, and plant use. And he has money now to further research. So that's his passion. He's putting it into animal research. So he, uh, if you believe him, is that uh, he has a, a kind heart and he's not really about money. So yeah, everything is kind of closed up shop in Australia. He's done with that. Comes back with nothing to his name, really. And then what happens? Well, he's now decided this is a yet another appearance with Art on uh, Coast to Coast. He has come back on to explain to Art that he wanted to get to the bottom of the belt buckle situation. So he goes back to Ellensburg, where he had sold the other belt buckles he had made to jewelry stores in the area, and while he was there, he found a guy who had one of his buckles. And he said, mm -hmm. oh, you know, let, I want to take a look at this. And he's trying to figure out why they would have taken my belt buckle. So he goes over to the guy. He's like, oh, you know, I made this. Can I take a look at it? And he's like, sure. So they take it off and he takes a look at it. And he realizes it has these three coins affixed to it in the metal mm -hmm. work. There was a coin uh, with Winston Churchill on it, another one with Stalin, and one with Franklin Roosevelt that was a dime. Well, so what's really interesting about this is that the dime was minted in the year 1943, and there was no 1943 Roosevelt dime because the dime was made after Roosevelt died, and he died in 1946. Mm -hmm. On top of that, it was minted with the letter B on it. And as far as we all know, there is no mint in the United States with a B. There's a D for Denver. Right, and, S for San Francisco. Yeah, and maybe P Philadelphia, is that, I think? Yes, yeah. I believe you're right, P for Philadelphia. And the motif that Mel says was going into, into the design was kind of to celebrate the Yalta Conference, right? Right. Uh, with Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin. And that's what he was going for artistically. And that's why he used those coins. And he just soldered them into facets on this belt. And also there was a silver fork that was bent and fashioned into part of this buckle. And he just could never figure out like, okay, there's coins in there. But like, if you're, 
if you're some uh, men in black types or the cigarette smoking man, why the heck are you taking my, my belt to hold my pants up? What's the point of that? Well, he thinks back to where he got these dimes from. And what he remembers is that he found them in a little red Chinese lucky money envelope on the land near the yeah. hole. And there were 10 of them in there. Keep this in mind. We mentioned that in part one. So I believe that was talked about, or he mentioned that to Art a few years ago now. Right. When he was originally telling the story about all the weird stuff he found on his property. Like, yeah, I found a you know red Chinese lucky envelope that Chinese folks will uh, give to each other for good luck on New Year's. And it's a pretty common thing. You'll see them here in LA and they're they're actually fun to uh, to buy the envelopes. You can put anything you want in them. That's right. But he found one on his property and it had 10 dimes in it. Right. And he gave some of them away as a gift. And he took the rest and made them into these belt buckles, one of which was probably his own that was taken from him. So now that he and this guy are looking at this one and the guy's like, well, I should get this checked out because this is weird. So he decides that he's going to go see a, a coin collector, an expert, and ascertain what the deal is with the coin. The coin collector is completely slack-jawed. He's just flummoxed beyond belief. He cannot figure out what this dime is with the year 1943 and Roosevelt and then a B on it. He has mm -hmm. no idea what it's for. What I will tell you without knowing any backstory, this coin collector, because uh, yes, I, for a brief period of time, I collected stamps. <laughs> it oh, was that's fun. Nice. Yeah. And I, I still have that book somewhere. But what I learned about stamps, it's like, uh, was it there's that three cent stamp with the upside down airplane? Yeah. It's like a half million dollars, that one. It might be one of the most expensive uh, or valuable stamps out there ever. And the reason is because the plane is not supposed to be upside down. I think that was, uh, is it the Wright Brothers? Uh, it looks like a Wright Flyer, I believe. Yeah. Anything with a mistake on it that's mass produced, especially with coins or stamps or anything that's official like that, is now that value has gone way up. If you watch Antiques Roadshow, it's like, yes, there's 10 million of this item you have uh, you got out of your closet or from a, a thrift shop, it's not worth anything. This thing here that you got, there's only four left in the world. That's why it's super valuable. So in this case, a dime like that, like, oh, is that a misminting of this coin? Like, wow, that is going to be very rare right off the bat without anything paranormal happening. That dime is now worth something. Yeah. So these were special dimes that he had just collected and he'd never noticed before the anomaly. On Never the really thought about it until this moment. So the guy who has the buckle that he had already bought, obviously it's his dime now, takes it to the coin guy. The coin guy's like, this is really weird. And he's like, I'll tell you what, I will give you a lot of money for this right now. Yep. And he, yep. he makes him a very generous offer. And the gentleman who owns the buckle's like, no, I don't want that. I'm, I'm going to hang on to it for now. He's going to think Here's about it. Here's my number. Yeah. We can, maybe we can talk in the future. And then a couple of days later, the guy with the other one of Mel's buckles is visited by U.S. Treasury officials mm -hmm. who took the coin, took the belt buckle, took it away. And, uh, of course, he was thinking, wow, I should have sold it to the coin dealer. They don't let anything get by them, especially the Treasury. Imagine the yes. IRS after you. It's, uh, we're going to need that money back. It's at this point in the story that Mel makes this amazing analogy. I believe it is not a metaphor, but analogy, where he talks about how mm. in the middle of every intersection, on the road, you know, there's always little piles of nuts and bolts. Mm -hmm. And he's starting to think that maybe that's what the land is like around the hole. Right. Because all of these things he picks up around there seem to have, as you said, some sort of magical, strange quality to them or some sort of factor that makes them not belong yeah. in our world or seemingly not belong here. Imagine a crossroads of sorts. That's what he's talking about at an intersection, especially if there's been a, a few collisions there in the intersection. You get little bits of debris, uh, springs, nuts and bolts, little pieces of uh, possibly a, a nameplate, a name badge from a car, all kind of connecting as they get shoved to the center and never really cleaned up. And maybe that's what's happening here. Maybe yeah. this hole in the property is a crossroads from... Several different realities, shall we say, because here's the deal. They don't really mint coins after presidents until they've died. So here's the facts in our reality. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was born January 30th, 1882 in Hyde Park, New York, and died April 12th, 1945 at age 63. Not 1943. So... That means that dime would have been minted two years before he actually died, which is not the case, at least in our reality. 
or it's just 10 dimes all with the same anomaly in manufacturing, which again, that just makes them very valuable. Nothing supernatural there suggesting uh, that's the case, but it's very odd. It would just make them super valuable. Yeah. And before we move on, one other interesting thing to consider about the dime, which fits into all of this. <laughs> of course, as hours of interviews have gone by over several years with Art and Mel, and it's probably one of the people he's interviewed uh, the most, I think, about a single story. That's not somebody who's uh, an author or an expert or anything. They kind of get to know each other in a sense. And all along, earlier in this interview segment that we're talking about currently, earlier Art asks Mel, like, do you have a Bible handy? Can you just swear to me on that Bible that your tongue That's the right. truth? Yeah. <laughs> They're kind of going back and forth. He's like, okay, I got one right here. Yes, I swear. This is actually the truth as much as I know. And uh, they make a joke and Art says, can you swear that's the whole truth? He says, well, I don't know about the whole truth. Yeah. It's the absolute truth. Whole, get it? Yeah. Joe, L yeah. E, truth. Yeah. So they have a laugh about that. It's all very fun, but he's, uh, Art's invested in this. It's a, it's an ongoing saga. And all along he's saying like, look, can you just give me a photo? Can you give us a photo? Can you give us anything? Right. Maybe a better location, a photo of something anything. And he said, uh, what about the dime? You still have a dime there. And, he, and I believe he did have one in his possession. Yeah. At that point, he's like, can you take a picture of the dime? Right. Now here's the interesting, and, and yes, it's convenient aspect about the dime. Mel claimed, and it's not just Mel, according to uh, the other people that had the other dimes, and I think also the Walther P38, they claimed that if you set the dime on a table, and I believe it was get further than 10 feet away from this dime, you couldn't see it anymore. Right. Now, a couple interesting things about that. Again, that's a fun little narrative sci-fi thing, right? It just kind of evaporates from view, much like the sound can't escape anything solid. Perhaps whatever's near the hole absorbs everything. Sound, light, energy. It's transmitting uh, baseball games <laughs> from 1963. It's doing all these kind of weird things, and the visual part of it is just one more. And also, it can't be photographed because Mel claimed his nephew tried to scan it, tried to take photographs of it, and doesn't really go into it, but he said it's blurry. I don't know if it totally disappeared, but he said, uh, yeah, it's just not possible. I, I would love to send you a photo of the dime because... That's easy to do. I'm not violating anybody's property or giving anything away that's going to uh, compromise anybody's safety, security, or privacy, or any Native American spiritual property that now people are going to trounce on. He's like, that's fine. There is an image floating out there of a dime that fits the description. It is stamped 1943. It is an FDR dime. And it has the B on it. Yeah, that one's a hoax. I've seen that one. Yeah. It's bad so, Photoshop, that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, again, you could claim that even if Mel produced one. You could say, well, like, come on, that's baloney. It's just a photo. Like, there's nothing you can do, folks. It's that even if he showed you a picture of this or the whole, it's like, well, what does that prove? Especially nowadays, anything can be fake. But we've made that claim in years past, and people didn't believe it then. It's like, well, it's just all fake. So you believe what you want to. And here, though, yes, it is convenient. You can't produce a photograph or a reproduction of this dime. But let's talk about this in a paranormal stance in that it reminded me, uh, a news report or series, and again, I can't remember what it was, uh, but I always remember this, this segment of it where a semi-pro photographer and astronomy buff, but he lives on the Florida coast and he was on his deck. And of course he loves to take astronomy photos and he's got a pretty good setup, right? He's got a telescope, which is attaches to a DSLR and he's all ready to go to take uh, astronomy photos, right? And he's on his deck and he, uh, it's about dusk, I believe, uh, but still plenty of light. And he sees that weird anomaly, right? It's that shape changing silvery kind of object just floating off the ocean so he wants to get a better look at it, and he sets up uh, the telescope and the camera, and he notices that with the naked eye, it looks kind of blurry and uh, amorphous, and it seems to be, I think, changing shape on him, but just hovering there, and uh, it just kind of showed up, and 
he gets the telescope out and he's able to take photographs of it. Now, here's the interesting part of that, which I, I found as an interesting fact. He shows photographs that he did take of it. And it's no clearer than looking at it with the naked eye. Right. Yes, you can see it as blurry and everybody makes a joke like, ah, blurry photos or whatever. Like, it's blurry to the naked eye. He has a professional telescope with a DSLR high-res camera on it. And in the photo, it's still blurry. Yes. Yeah. So what's yeah. going on there? So this dime is you walk away and it disappears. Is there something optical going on? Is this a little bit of the Philadelphia experiment with the uh, the disappearing battleship at the right harmonics? Who knows? But it's fun. It's fun to think about. Anyway, so there's there's your dime story. It's unreproducible, unprovable, like most everything in the story. So then, though, right after that, we come along with a little section of something that does seem real, that anyone mm -hmm. can prove or that can say is interesting. And that relates to satellite imagery of what is purportedly Mel's land. And so... <laughs> This is a fascinating thing about it. A lot of folks who are not as old as Force and I might not remember this, but way before mm. Google Earth came along, Microsoft had a project called the Terra Server. That's right. And it was the coolest thing in the world. This was the original idea where you could go on and find satellite imagery of anywhere in the world. You, It didn't mm -hmm. work as smoothly, obviously, as Google Earth does now. Yeah. But um, I remember playing around on it when I first discovered it. Now, I can't remember what year that was, but it was way before Google Earth. Quick question here. Your dad is a map nut, right? He yes, loves he maps. Is. Yes, uh, <laughs> I do too. I don't know why. But he's got terabytes of map data, right, from the old That's days. That's correct, he does. He has some very sophisticated uh, GPS programs, way beyond prosumer level. Right. And right. so he has terabytes of maps because it's all different depths. You know, that's what you forget. When you look on Google Earth and you zoom down or you change your elevation, in air mm -hmm. quotes, because mm -hmm. it's not really elevation, but you change your elevation that the pictures were taken from, and you move in, mm -hmm. that, you know, right. that may be five, ten layers of different shots that are taken at all different heights or different focal lengths. But then on right. top of that, you can have a series of maps that are topographical yes. and are more illustrations than actual photos. So he has all that stuff. So like, in, and as a result, I used to have it in a, I had an iPad that I used to go on uh, off-road expedition mm -hmm. trips with, and I loaded up a bunch of his maps into that. So I could pull up anything. And as long as it had a GPS signal, I could switch to topo maps, to BLM maps, to um, actual satellite oh, photos right. from different years, right. all that stuff. Um, it's pretty pretty amazing. You can really get caught up in it. It takes up a lot of data. Yeah. But back at this point, TerraServer was the only game in town for non-paper, for digital maps. Right, right. And what Mel's nephew had found out was that when you went to the Manastash Ridge and you looked at where Mel's property was, it was blacked out. Or should I say whited out? There was a big white box. <laughs> yeah. Two squares. Should have been. Two squares. Yeah. Right. Two square grids of the map were just white. Yeah. That's a little bit like, and so, and Mel is on the air with Art, and he's like, anybody can go there. Go now. Go to the Terra server, find Ellensburg, zoom out a little bit, and when you see the right. white blocks on the Manastash Ridge to the west of town, that's where my property is. And he, he says, yeah. why do you think those are expunged? And for me, when I heard this point, I was <laughs> mm -hmm, just like, mm -hmm. okay, invisible dime, no pictures. We don't get to see anything. There's a, yeah, it's a little right. I went to Australia no, and I saved wombats, uh -huh. but it's like, this is real. This is a redacted satellite image. Right. right. Back in the early days of satellite images being online. Right. Nowadays, we've all seen that. In fact, there's top 10 uh, videos on YouTube about like the 10 most uh, weird places that are blotted out on Google Earth. Yes. And it'll be pixelated or just black. That's my favorite. Just It's just black. That's right. Data missing. Now, if you're thinking, that's why Mel chose this area here. He's, maybe he's from central Washington or eastern Washington, and he just picked this because, like, that adds to the mystery a couple of years later. Right. Well, Mel's first appearance was 1997. Terra Server did not come out until eight months after his appearance. So, Mel, using that as part of a story that he knew he could seed later, and, like, two years later, yes. <laughs> is that... He had to have picked the spot in Ellensburg near the Manastash Ridge before he knew that the grid spots would be whited out. So it seems to be the case that this is true. So it's a tremendous coincidence. It's a real coincidence. That's what I'm saying is that he just happened to pick a spot where he claimed his hole was. And that also just happened to be a spot where the data was missing 
on one pass of this Terra server. Or are we all the mark? I'm just saying, I'll elaborate on it a little more towards the end of tonight's mm-hmm. show, but you I'm just do. saying, what if this is a PSYOP? This is disinformation. We're the mark. And the reason he was able to determine that it would be redacted eight months before the Terra server came out is because this is all a plot to conceal something by making it super fantastic and unbelievable, just like Terry Lovelace's tiny little monkeys that wanted him to leave the house with them. Dude, you just blew my conclusions. <laughs> <sighs> Wait, I, I didn't just, go into depth there. Oh, man. I, that's, I, I'm just saying. Forget it, forget it. Let's just, let's go to the end. I have nothing else to say. <laughs> just, you uh, think this no, was a you, psyop? No, This look, just we, proves uh, we don't actually, pre-plan anything, folks. <laughs> Boy, and should we? I don't know. Some people like that. Some people hate it. Yeah. It's too pre-planned. Yeah. It's not planned enough. We don't know what to do. Are you scripted? Just, just We're not tell scripted. Us what you want to please you. Yeah. <laughs> Here's my matter. point about that. Yeah. No, we. You know what? I pay a lot of attention, and you're just now coming on board with this. Is to listen for the signs, watch for the signs, messages from the universe, whatever you want to call it. There are signs and wonders that are being uh, whispered to you. Pay attention to the whispers, not the loud voices. Not the naysayers, not the tinfoil hat crowd, nor the hardcore, I've made my mind up already, folks. Listen to not the loud voices, but the whispers. And one that came across was, I'm not going to mention this gentleman's name. Let's just say he is part of a military government think tank organization of sorts, and he had a post on LinkedIn. Pretty innocuous, right? Right. Well, it was leading to a very cool, very well-produced, let's say, recruitment video called Ghost in the Machine for the U.S. Army's Psy Warfare, Psy Ops. It's basically a recruitment video, and it's pretty cool. And I showed that to you a while ago, and then I had the idea, it's like, yes, is that what's happening here? Is that part of a, as the magician does, look over here because the coin, the Chinese FDR non-existent dimes are not in this hand. They're in the other one. While I am uh, doing a little flourish here, I'm going to pull one of these dimes out of your ear and you'll be surprised, but it's not magic. It's just diversion. It's better than having a magician pull a dime out of your hole. I'll tell you that. Oh, (laughs) nice one. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and that wasn't in the outline. I could. He's, he's that <laughs> no, brilliant, he folks. He just uh, came up with that one. Uh, but there's something being constructed here. I just don't know by whom. And I'm talking. Uh, you're talking about like with the weird elemental kind of things going on. Is it Hellier <laughs> goblins? Is it the government? Is it Mel? The only person I trust here that's in the same boat with us is Art Bell. Right. I don't know. Mm. There's no question Mm. that at the time that Mel called in, those images were blocked out. It should exceed his ability to participate in what the terror server is showing and what it's not showing. Terror server's still around. There's another website for it now. I don't know if it got sold by Microsoft to this other company, but it's more of a a business-to-business solution, I think, now than, Mm. than Google Earth, say, is for goofing around, or at least available to everybody. And I, we did find a message on a message board about mm-hmm. uh, seemingly from someone who worked on the terror server saying, oh, that happened all the time. Images yeah, yeah. were obscured. But that doesn't change the fact that you also obscure images you don't want people to see. No matter how common no. it happens right. accidentally or due to a coding error, you also do that when you don't want people to see something. It's a common feature that fuels the conspiracy theory is that you find enough little weird things to fit your narrative and that keeps your belief going. Because right. there's another Reddit thread, and, and uh, we don't have time to get into it here, but it's another snapshot, let's say, from Google Earth. And there happens to be one tiny cloud yes. obscuring the exact spot where people think Mel's hole I is. have that picture, actually. We'll post okay. that with our, yes, I have that very picture. But you know what? Clouds happen. So who knows? But it's got one cloud out of the entire Pacific Northwest. Yeah making its way past the Cascades to obscure a tiny dot in Ellensburg. Come on, man. It would also be remarkably easy to Photoshop. I can't think of anything easier than Photoshopping a low-resolution satellite image to do whatever you want at this point. So that's the thing Mm. about now. And a little bit the thing about back when the issue happened with the Terra server, I guess I'll just go ahead and get to this part now. You can just Photoshop whatever you want it to look like into it. You don't have to redact it. You can... Clone mm-hmm. stamp a piece of the earth from another section right over the thing yeah. you're trying to cover mm-hmm. up. We, and, and we get that. So 
moving mm-hmm. forward, there there were a few other details that we plucked out that from our notes that we did want to mention. One of them also being that Mel had heard reports from his trucker friends, and he seems to know a lot mm-hmm. of truck drivers for whatever reason. Yes. Um, which we've gotten to know a few over the years just because uh, they're listening. Those are the right folks. now. Yeah, <laughs> and thank a you, long guys. Drive. Yeah. Thankfully, we don't put those folks to sleep. So anyway, I guess some of Mel's trucker friends told him that the one of them delivered a huge quantity of fiber optic cable to a warehouse right. in Ellensburg, and it was an unusual amount or quantity of fiber optic cable. Right. And then uh, later said that all of the folks who were handling it when it was dropped off were apparently Israeli. And yeah, at the warehouse that raised some red flags. However, for me, it doesn't raise any red flags. A bunch of fiber optics, uh, maybe Israeli intelligence, all within a 15 20 minute drive from the Yakima firing range doesn't seem suspicious at all to me. Not even a little. They are an ally, but again, there's a there's some uh, elbow uh, brustling here between uh, the intelligence. Yeah, but agencies. you exchange information and work together all the time, especially Israel and the U.S. It's just not fishy right. to me that particular thing. But here's the thing: we're not experts, and that no, also we're not. is that you know don't do the. But thing I have read I, a I, lot I, of Tom Clancy me. and no, a lot okay. of Robert Ludlum. <laughs> oh well, you are an expert, and though. I do read a lot of actually that kind of international news because I I enjoy the diplomacy and the intrigue and the spy mm-hmm. stuff. I do enjoy that stuff, and I do feel like you've got this firing range there. They're testing weapon systems. There's a, a, an exchange of information. All kinds of deals are made constantly. Not surprising to me to have those personnel and that gear on site right, very close right. to the firing range. However, guess what? We have a lot of people out there who know a whole lot more than us, even in our own research group, and they mm-hmm. can all clap back on me, whatever needs to be said about how wrong I am. We haven't checked yet. We're going to, uh, before we finish this out, check with Bert. Maybe he knows. Yes. Yeah, you don't know why or, you know, the purpose of weird things that get delivered. However, what I will say is that material has to come from somewhere. The Army doesn't make everything that it uses, right? So they have to buy some commercial goods and services. And it makes me think of the Nazi bell. The myth around the Nazi bell was that perhaps one of them, at least, was taken to the United States after the war because... People notice and can swear to this, and I think there's even a bill, uh, a, a, a way bill of sale or lading, a large amount of this very specialized ceramic block was delivered to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base around the time that people say that this thing was delivered at the same place. Right. That's non-conductive, blah, 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 and that you had to build this around the bell when you crank that thing up to keep it from killing everybody in a, a 10 meter uh, distance. And then you stand at a distance and throw uh, P-38s at it and see where they go. <laughs> <laughs> well, then you get a chronovisor thing uh, happening uh, where you can see into the past and, and the famous battles and whatnot. My point being is that, yeah... People do know weird stuff because it's like they have to be the contractor for it. Right. So that's one thing. Now, another thing that uh, talking about truckers is that uh, Mel said that people have been telling him after his appearance there, guess what? On that highway uh, that goes to Yakima, he he said uh, he thought it was 84 or 85, there's a rest stop there. And people would say, not just truckers, but other people stopping there. If you look towards his property, they could also see that black beam shooting into the sky. Yeah as if a flashlight could shoot a perfectly black beam blotting out all light. They claimed to Mel that they were able to see it on occasion. Now, Mel will say he's never seen it himself. Still claim that. So he just said, well, other people have told me that. I've never seen it, but there you go. That may happen again. Well, so all of this stuff, a lot of it's recap. There's this new information. There's still strange things going Mm -hmm. on. And just when you think that this story is ready to crawl into the ground and be buried. It turns out that Mel (laughs) Mm. may have stumbled across another hole, another bottomless hole, (laughs) bottomless, endless pit in a mysterious location in Nevada, home of Las Vegas and Reno. Well, here's a little thing which I thought was hilarious because uh, you you can try sending uh, Mel or art an email because mel said is it uh nevada or nevada and he asks art who has been living there for a long time art says no i say nevada i can get kind of mumbles off like i don't know you could ask yeah. different people whatever he says it's kind of mumbled but i thought like that's the one you're getting an email about where it's no no it's 
Yeah. I've heard it both ways, and I feel sure that whoever says it whichever way thinks the other way is wrong. So <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go with that. One thing I do know is that nobody says Oregon except for Stevie oh, yeah. Dan. And you can to tell make it work how in a song. I cross my old man back yeah. in Oregon. He's just not from the area. Yeah. That's fine. Being from the Pacific Northwest, I've only ever heard it said uh, as Nevada with a flat A. Yes. But in this case, you're talking about something that's such a old chestnut trope, the bottomless pit. We've all heard yeah. of that, right? It's the idea of the bottomless pit you uh, or the bottomless cup of coffee. Both are uh, very highly sought all you can after. Eat sushi. Endless breadsticks. Yeah, it's the, the, the thought that it, it something never ends. Well, this is just one of those other weird mysteries, perhaps, or just a good story. So in this case, though, uh, yeah, people would say, like, what are the odds that uh, one gentleman here uh, comes on a, a, a hugely popular national syndicated radio show, has a claim of a bottomless pit, and then he finds another one? My only counterpoint to that, and I do have one, is that if you go on a nationally syndicated radio show and you tell hundreds mm -hmm. of thousands of people, if not millions, I don't know what their ratings are like at Coast to Coast or were at this yeah. time, that you have a magical bottomless pit, then odds are pretty good that other people who may have heard your story, who might have had one that they've never talked about, might reach out to you and be like, hey, you think you got a hole? Come look at my hole. Well, that was the original call. Is Mel's like, hey, I don't know what this thing is. I just told you I laid a bunch of uh, fishing line down it. If there's anyone out there that has more knowledge about this kind of stuff, let me know, because I'm, I'm intensely curious. I want answers. And that was the original intended, uh, stated intention of coming on the show with this crazy story, which just gets more and more crazy. And here, what Mel is claiming is that, well, eventually, Native Americans had heard of the program and had heard of the story and reached out to him because of the herbs he was working with, that they, they heard that part of the story. And they said, well, hey, you know, if you want to come learn about what we got here in northern Nevada... We're working also with natural remedies and could be ancient Native American uh, medicinal cures. He had already explained that it initiated, that stuff initiated with them. Right, He was right. co-opting it from the Native American science. Yeah, and part of the legend of, of Mel, as he, as he tells Art, it's like, look, I'm not selling any books. There's no Mel's magic hole elixir. I'm not selling or trying to make money. And basically, he just says, I, you know, if you believe he's... As he is stated, uh, he doesn't have two dimes to rub together. Well, that's not true. He may have uh, one or two left yeah. magic dimes from another reality or parallel universe. The other thing about the parallel <laughs> universe, I'll say quickly, it just popped into my head the story of the dog, the hunter's dog, and that that was told to him. Mel claims no responsibility for that story, but uh, the hunter who laid his dog the rest in the bottomless pit saw him again, and he described him as... He seemed like he was hunting with somebody else. Yes. And the dog looked exactly the same, but wouldn't come to him, couldn't hear him. Is that dog now hunting with a parallel hunter? <laughs> that's another version of that guy. And that can be seen by this guy. And that's why the dog's not coming. It's not exactly his dog, but it looks pretty close. Anyway, just fun concepts. Mel has been contacted by Native Americans in the region to come work and learn and exchange ideas. That's right. So he goes to meet up with these guys and to talk to them about the medicine that he's been working with. And as we said, that he indicated even from the very beginning that this particular herb that he was growing or whatever he was dealing with at his original property, he heard about it from Native Americans. And so he's been trying mm -hmm. to work with it and find out more about it. So if he gets opportunity to go work with them. And in fact, they uh, the area they were from in northern Nevada was the area that he had said that this particular plant had come from. But the point is, he's, he's going to go and make a connection with them. And then he gets up there to talk to them about, you know, the work he's doing. He's talking to them about the work they're doing. And then the discussion or the topic of his hole comes up. Hold for joke? No, Hold I'm sorry. Hold for joke. Continue, for please. Joke. So anyway, they said, well, yeah, you know, it's funny that you should have an endless hole. We might know where there's an endless hole, too. But he makes a good point of <laughs> saying right. that it's actually not on Native American land. It's not on reservation land. It's no. on essentially no. public land or probably BLM land. Art points out that most land in Nevada is Bureau of Land Management Control, yes. BLM. Anybody can 
go visit it. It's public lands, but there are restrictions, right? You yeah, it depends on what a, area you're in. As, as somebody who's camped in an off-road in these areas, you know, there's they have like the free range camping. They have other kind of camping right, right. where you you have to be within a certain number of feet of a road, From which can road, just yes. be a dirt road. There's other areas where you have more freedom. You just have to find out what the rules are in whatever particular area you're in. Yeah. But it's government property. That's the long and short of it. The Basque people are herding sheep on this property, which is is open to them to use, but they do not own it. Yes. But they know it like the back of their hand since the 1800s. And the Basque region, for folks that don't know, is in the mm -hmm. Pyrenees on the border between Spain and France. And it's a really unique area. We've talked about it on the show before because the uh, Basque people have a completely independent language. Yeah, there's no known root or proto-language, I believe, and then there's some speculation <laughs> that uh, they're connected to the Atlanteans. Yeah, but that's not coming from us. We're just sharing that information. No, but they're, again, they're interesting yes, people, uh, and there's a good concentration of them in northern yeah. Nevada. Not only that, southern Idaho, too. That's right. What's going on here is that he is in northern Nevada. He is talking to these bass, and they're like, you know, we know where something is. We can take you to it. It's not on our land, but it's on land we graze on. We're quite familiar with it and have been for close to 100 years. You should come take a look at this thing because the herbs that we're talking about here that are thought to be a possible miraculous cure for the Spanish flu and other significant fever-related ailments. Yes, respiratory, respiratory uh, diseases. Diseases yeah. grows around your hole Well, it's also growing around our hole here. Mm -hmm. So that's the connection that he's making. However, the attitude that Mel expresses is that the Native Americans know about this hole and their attitude is like, yeah, just stay away. Stay away. It's yes. not good. <laughs> Which is good common sense about everything, especially like Skinwalker Ranch. It's just like, yeah, don't, don't. Every don't time go they're like, it. stay away. Yeah, because the other news flash is, guess what they're not doing? Throwing a bunch of crap into it. Get it? Like uh, everyone down <laughs> right. in Washington, like, let's put the tires, let's put the refrigerator, let's put the... They're like, no, we don't know. We've never really thrown no, anything just, in there. <laughs> anything like this, it's best to stay away. Don't attract attention because you're busy just living your life, right? Yeah. You don't need any extra weirdness going on. So yeah, yeah, they see it, I think the Native Americans, as well as the Basque, view the area, the whole and the the land around it as, it's a bit spiritual. Yes. There's something unusual about that. So there's a little bit of and reverence. And there's a respect for the unknown that might have been lacking around Mel's Hole initially. What are you saying when you're throwing in trash, TV tubes, yeah. tires, yeah. cabinet furniture, yeah. uh, refrigerators, all that. I, again, I just love the idea that it's popping out somewhere where people are like, just stop that. What are you doing? Yeah. Like, just, like, there's a bunch of garbage and dead cows here. This hole that he describes finding in Nevada is different in several ways from the one on his property. One is specifically uh, with relationship to the opening and the construction around it. Apparently, this one it has a metal collar around it, a solid metal collar. Two feet high and about two feet wide. And I think going down as far as they could see. So unlike Mel's hole, where it had a stone built retaining wall, which went down about 15 feet. I think it was maybe about a foot or two uh, high off the ground. Not a huge lip or retaining collar to the hole in Washington state. This one though has, uh, it's not natural, right? So there's a some kind of metal that's fashioned around the ring of this hole, around the lip of it. And also there's notches in it that Mel describes. Like you could uh, possibly work something with it, like like a lid. Yeah. Like maybe it was an interlocking lid or something at some point was able to, to close up this hole, but it's not there anymore. The other strange thing about it, again, coming back with sound, is that uh, he dropped a, a wrench on it. Yes, on the lip. Yes, it made no noise. Yeah. Then you could pound on it with a sledgehammer, or crowbar, still didn't make any noise. Yeah, there's no clanging, there's no ringing, there's no nothing. I, you know, he doesn't describe it, but in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, it's just like a, a dull thud or something, which mm -hmm. would imply really significant density or a very peculiar material or a combination of those things. Yeah. And so this hole is not, definitely not natural. There's some mm -hmm. perception that Mel's hole may be natural, the Nevada hole it's got some machining associated with it, yet it's right. on BLM land. And the other thing that Mel says about this particular location, which he will not divulge, is mm -hmm. that it is devoid of anything. There are no signs of habitation anywhere around it. No buildings, no telephone lines, no yeah. roads, no structures of any kind. This thing is out in the middle of nowhere. 
And the local Basque sheep herders are like, mm-hmm. well, at least one of them who's 80 years old right. said he had known of it since he was 10. Yeah, at least, right. Yeah, at least, at least, and probably longer. So yeah, that's one thing in common, though, even though they don't look totally the same. Actually, they're about nine feet in diameter. That is one thing the that's diameter, uh, similar. That's right. Right. Uh, as far as the uh, other hole, is that the is that the dimensional hole standard, uh, the ISO standard for uh, <laughs> you know, interportal, interdimensional portal holes? That's one odd thing. But yes, old, beyond the people that first came to the region. So this Basque elder great-grandfather, as Mel calls him, calm and wise, and he says, yes, it's been here as long as I can remember, and then from his childhood, stories abound that it was here when they got here. So I, I can't remember off the top of my head when the Basque arrived in the in the area, I would guess late 1800s. Right. It was already here, and I don't think anybody claimed to have done additions or improvements on it. It just, that would be freaky if they showed up and there was already metal around it. Yeah, significantly well-machined, industrial age, metallic flange that appeared to, at one point, made up to some kind of lid. Like, in my mind, it's kind of like a missile silo. But yeah, you imagine the, the, a big interlocking yeah. uh, lid on it that maybe twisted and clamped down. Just so folks know, from nine foot in diameter, I don't think uh, from what little cursory research I did, even the mm-hmm. Minuteman two missiles are those are twelve feet across those openings, and there's all kinds of stuff down in there that you can see very easily, even if the silo's empty. So right, right. Well, a couple of interesting things though. It's almost like the government or the military didn't know about this one yet. It's an undiscovered gem. Hey, look, they can't have their finger in the pie of everything they haven't found yet. So this was undiscovered and pristine, as he said, unmarked, no roads leading up to it. It's just there. You know why? So that's interesting. Because the bass and the Native Americans aren't going on coast to coast and blabbing all about it. (laughs) No, no. They're all over telling the whole world, hey, we got a hole. We found this hole. Come check it out. They're keeping it quiet because they respect it. Well, the bass are using it to graze. You know, they don't want this whole swath to be suddenly closed off to them. If you keep quiet, you can keep using it. The other thing, though, that Art said, uh, calling back a little earlier here, that was I found to be interesting is that, this is according to Art Bell now, this is not Mel. He says, after this all big hullabaloo that went down in Ellensburg, and of course, TV crews are showing up, they're searching for any kind of mail, they find no trace of any waters or mail or this and that. A TV crew did go to the location where they, they thought it would be near the area. And they did find a lot of military boot prints, as Mel would say, large yellow gear machinery treads. So somebody with a, an official, perhaps military interest was there in the area. At some point, yes. Now that is, again, that's according to Art and all the follow-up uh, stories that he heard. So it doesn't prove that there's a hole there. But it did prove that there's some activity there in an area where it's not that close to the Yakima firing range, right? That that activity should be over there. Right. The other thing is that we were talking about things that were delivered. According to Mel, he was told that large amounts of crated technical equipment arrived in the area on his property that somebody said, one of the truckers actually, said came from Lawrence Livermore Labs. Now, you can look them up, but they are also connected to, remember I mentioned this uh, this a lot, the uh, supposed carrot report yes. uh, about reverse engineering alien technology, and that has a connection to Lawrence Livermore, which also, remember, this was going around on the internet, these strange drone-like things that were showing up with all these kind of weird tentacles and stuff. Yes. That was supposedly located near Lawrence Livermore Labs. Right, right. So there's another connection. You know, big wireless providers forget that families come in all shapes and sizes, which is why Mint Mobile has decided to shake up the wireless industry with their brand new modern family plan. Each line starts at 15 bucks a month, and you only need two lines to get started. Yeah, no matter how big or small your family is, you deserve to save on your wireless service. Forrest and I have both had Mint Mobile for years now, Mm -hmm. and I've personally used it all over the country. And I can personally tell you that it's an extremely reliable network, and it's everywhere you need it to be. The thing is, I love cross-country road trips, and good wireless service is a necessity for them, especially these days with GPS. Absolutely. Well, look, do you hate your phone bill? 
15 bucks a month for wireless service is a way to change that. Mint Mobile gives you the best rate whether you're buying for one or a family. And, and like we said, at Mint, families start at just two lines. All plans come with unlimited talk and text plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Plus, Mint Mobile's modern family plan lets you mix and match data plans so everyone gets the amount of data that's right for them. And as we've said, you can use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone number along with all of your existing contacts. Switch to Mint Mobile to get premium wireless service starting at just 15 bucks a month. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month, including the modern family plan, go to mintmobile.com slash A-L. That's mintmobile.com slash A-L. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash A-L. We never get tired of learning about new things. As you can see from tonight's episode on Mel's Hole, it, mm -hmm. it can be as simple as the geography of the area we're discussing to the scientific theories behind possible explanations, and even if those theories are sociological or may relate to a hoax. Yeah, we were super excited to recently find a course about the West on Wondrium called The American West, History, Myth, and Legacy, taught by Patrick N. Allett, Ph.D. Remember him? Well, yes. We've talked about him before. Yes, yeah, we have. Terrific. Well, Dr. Allett's passion for the material is clear. He also does an exceptional job of keeping his lectures easy to follow. Yeah, I was particularly intrigued with Lecture 23 in this series, Mythology of the American West, where Dr. Allett discusses that the U.S. Census Bureau declared that the Western frontier had disappeared in 1890. Yeah. Imagine what that news felt like for us to like a country that was used to just you just keep going and going yeah. and going and it's like nope not anymore we're done we've we've reached the edge yeah you've gone to the end of the internet yes. well Dr Allett mentions historian Frederick Jackson Turner's essay on the frontier which he presented at the 1893 World's Fair in Chicago Turner posited in his essay that the Western frontier formed America's character and its democratic ethos commonly thought to be developed in the East, and he laid out an ever-repeating chain of events where generations of settlers migrated, uh, lived primitively, temporarily, cooperated to subdue the wilderness, uh, built new institutions and cities and towns, and passed the torch down to the next generation who would venture further west and do the same thing. Yeah, and people loved this idea back then because it showed that the U.S. developed its character and democracy internally, based on internal experiences, uh, specifically out west, not leaning on Europe for that framework. However, and here is the crucial context, Turner's thesis is no longer considered valid due to its disrespect for Native Americans and the lack of references to women, who were obviously integral to the story. That said, it was hugely influential for a long time. Yeah, that context teaches you the big picture in every historical scenario. You have to look outside the moment, and that's what professors like Dr. Allett excel at over at Wondrium, and that's frankly one of the reasons we love it. Wondrium is very clearly focused on helping us all become better versions of ourselves. There are hundreds of topics taught by university professors there. On top of documentaries, uh, video tutorials that teach you new hobbies like photography, cooking, crafting, or health and wellness. And all of Wondrium's content is world-class and credible. We, you know, we say always check your sources, but with mm -hmm. Wondrium, we know we don't have to worry about the sources. And on top of that, Wondrium is always ad-free. That's true. Well, we want you to sign up for Wondrium today. Wondrium is offering our listeners a free trial plus 20% off the annual plan. Now, to get this offer, you need to visit our special URL, wondrium.com slash legends. Again, that's W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M dot com slash legends. Sign up today. This is Boyer. And thank you for listening to Astonishing Legends. Let's get back to the show. One of the other features of this particular hole in Nevada is that the the metallic flange actually apparently generated heat, a low level of heat, and it was warm enough that you could camp next to it, which is what the Basques and the Native Americans would do when they were in the area, and also apparently what Mel did, because he stayed there with them for several mm -hmm. nights. I think it was about five people. They stayed there. And they would camp and put their sleeping bags or their tents up against it because heat would radiate out yeah. of it. And so that's interesting. Why is that happening? And maybe that's just a natural effect of whatever it is. Well, as you know, if, if you dig a mine, it gets hot the closer you get towards uh, all that uh, molten good yeah. stuff on the uh, core of the earth. It wasn't too hot. It wasn't like hot to the touch. Uh, it wasn't like a thermal vent, but they said they could lay their sleeping bags near it and it would keep them warm. 
but it also didn't get too cold or too hot around it. It would just, it kept a neutrality, which was interesting. The other thing is that locals, uh, yeah, they didn't experiment with finding its depth, but they also described that dogs would not go near it. And some people also claimed that they saw a black beam shooting out of it, which lasted for a short burst. And again, Mel said, well, I never saw it that while I was there, but others have told him, if you believe the story. So then they decide that they're going to do an experiment. Mel being kind of a researcher, as we already know, based on what he had mm. done with his own hole, several experiments. And so he decided that it was important to determine what is going on with this hole in Nevada. So he went and bought some bags of ice. This was his theory. I thought this was actually pretty brilliant. So he's going to do a control mm -hmm. experiment where he takes some of the ice, he puts yeah. it in a bucket, leaves it on the surface, and the rest they put into another bucket and they lower it down into the Nevada hole. Right. They only had 1,500 feet of line, which tracks, you know, that they had available, and they lower the ice in the bucket down 1,500 feet. And then the idea was to watch the ice on the surface, and when it was about halfway melted, bring up the ice in the bucket that's down in the hole and see if it too is halfway melted or in any other state. So they did that and they brought it back up and it turned out that the ice in the bucket had not melted at all. Yeah, they waited till uh, half of the uh, the few bags of 7-Eleven ice yes. were partially melted. And they figured like, okay, so there's some reaction time, right? That's time right. has passed. Let's see what has changed with the ice that has been lowered. Right. And you would think if the collar and the shaft itself is radiating heat, that maybe the ice that had gone down in the hole would be at mm -hmm. least partially melted. So they bring it back up, and it's not. And not only that, Mel explains that when he put his hand in the ice that came back up from the shaft, mm -hmm. it wasn't cold. He said you could put your hand in it. It wasn't cold. He said it almost felt like a block of glass. Well, that's what Art said is like, well, it would be like kind of like holding blocks of glass. Yes. Like there's a neutrality to it, not hot glass, not cold glass. Right. And then Mel says, well, you know what it kind of felt like is that uh, you ever take one of those desiccant packets, those, uh, the gel packs that keep uh, products dry. He said, uh, you ever rip those open? And Art says, no, no, I've never done that. <laughs> uh, you know, you pack. don't eat it. Yeah. They feel they're little, little beads and they feel kind of odd. He said it was kind of a texture like that as best as he could describe. But Mel self-admittedly here uh, says he is at a loss for words. There's no way for him to describe this accurately. He doesn't know what words to use. It was all very strange. Right. And so then they're collecting and they're like, well, I wonder why, what's going on with it. It doesn't feel cold. So then they take it over to a fire and they mm -hmm. put it in the fire and it catches on fire. Yes. So they take it <laughs> off the fire right away and uh, they put it down uh, on the dirt, I guess, or in the bucket or whatever, and, and it's still burning. The ice that is not cold that has gone down the shafts, come back out, is now burning and giving off heat. And he said there wasn't like, it, there wasn't a pronounced flame. It was more like how a gas stove looks, like right after you've mm -hmm. turned it off and it's been hot, sort of glowing. You know what it reminded me of is way back when, when we covered the Mary Celeste, our great pal Doc Coggs did an experiment with alcohol burning in, under a glass, yes, right? Yes, yes. Because that was one of the uh, the theories of what made them leave the Mary Celeste because they were carrying denatured alcohol, I believe, and that uh, there was some rattling. They thought like, hey, this thing could blow up any second. Let's get into a lifeboat and put some line out, get some distance between right. us. And uh, that's one of the theories and that uh, they, they did. It's like, well, if this thing blows, at least we'll survive that. But somehow they got disconnected from the ship, it didn't blow, and now they're going to starve to death in a robot. Right. Doc Hogs in a video, demonstrates how that happens. And it's a bit of a flicker and a glow, but not like a bright orange flame like you would see off a campfire. So don't imagine that. These aren't flaming cubes. They are giving off uh, a bit of an aura. And this is the part where Mel says, I'm sorry, that's as best as I can describe. I'm not doing this right. very well. He said he didn't have the vocabulary for it, I believe, or something similar. Right. So there's something strange going on. They're just trying what they can. He said, it's like the molecular structure of the water, of the ice, whatever it is, in its solid to gas state is has been altered right. by being down in the hole. The other weird thing that uh, he, he mentioned here is that that metal retaining collar around the hole, he says, you couldn't hacksaw it. You can't make a dent in it. It, it wouldn't be right. hacksawed and no markings. Right. It just is. Seemingly indestructible. Right, right. Well, uh, that didn't stop there. Yeah, so to one of the locals is like, well, this is pretty awesome. This is a heat source. I think I'm going to take some of this home. 
uh, he's going to take it home. He puts it in a bucket or something, takes it home, and he puts it in the wood stove in his little cabin. He's, and it's a very simple little cabin. It gets pretty cold out there. Northern Nevada is cold that time of year because I think this was around January or something. So he took apparently like a coffee can worth of it, took it home and put it in the wood stove in his cabin with uh, no wood in there. And that's something that he was going to use to keep him warm. So we'll come back to that. But uh, Art asked him at this point, he's like, why, how many times does this happen? Can you just lower ice down there and keep pulling out these strange Mm -hmm. heat sources? And Mel says, no, it doesn't happen every time. It happens maybe one out of three times. Right. And Art asks him, do you have any of this yourself? And he's like, no, I, I didn't take anything with me, of course. And so... Art also asked, were there any markings on the metal on the flange, any kind of writing? And he said, no, uh, there was there was no kind of writing of any kind. Well, just when you think the story can't get any weirder, it takes another turn. Now, before we take this <laughs> turn, uh, Forrest yes. and I both felt that perhaps we should give a heads up warning. Let's just say there are more experiments to be done. And what's nearby that the Basque have? Well, they got plenty of sheep. So... Scott and I want to give you a a trigger warning and time to shut this off or skip ahead. If this stuff kind of bothers you in that there's about to be an experiment with one of the sheep and the hole, now's the time to skip over this part. But what we want to express is that Mel on the show, he is very upset in relaying this part of the story and wanted the audience to know, as we heard earlier, he spent all of his money on wombat research. Wombat rescue, specifically. Right, yeah. and and paid for a research facility to be set up with his millions. And that is part of the character that's being described as Mel. And he said, look, it really wasn't my idea, but I feel very ashamed that I went along with this. So we just want to let you know that there will be some experimentation done on the whole with a helpless sheep. And if that kind of thing bothers you, uh, this is your warning to uh, to watch out for that. Well, this particular story bothers me. It's a little bit crazy. So they did decide it was time to uh, maybe do an experiment and lower something into the hole and see what would happen. And of course, the bass being sheep herders had plenty of sheep around. So they rounded up a sheep and they had uh, created a box or built a box, I guess, to put the sheep in, which it did not want to go in because animals didn't want to get near this hole either. Yeah. And so they had... They took steps to uh, convince it to comply that were physical in nature and had it put into the box. Uh, And then they began lowering it down into this hole, into the Nevada hole. As they're lowering it down, it is physically fighting the idea of going into the shaft. For those of you looking for a fictional alternative to this theoretically real scenario, which again, Mm -hmm. if you believe any of this at all, just think of the goat in Jurassic Park. Uh, Uh, in the first movie that they left out in the Mm -hmm. cage. It's basically what they're doing is trying to figure out, well, what's going to happen if a living creature goes down in there? You know, after all my speech about how they didn't throw things into the hole, they were the first Mm. ones to put an animal into the hole. Folks have to realize, if you're not from the area or have anything to do with uh, animal husbandry or agriculture, people who do work with that have a different attitude in in that they respect the animals that they work with because that is part of their livelihood there is a relationship between the the herder and the animal that is different than people who might want a sheep for a pet right or any kind of other animal is that you who do not have any experience with that are going to see it differently than they do and that's all I'll say is that the bass sheep herders have a different attitude than people who might see a sheep at a petting zoo. This is not to them an animal that you keep in a petting zoo and, uh, you know, that's not the purpose for herding the sheep. So in their sense, they are intensely curious. And as Mel describes the bass people, he, he has a lot of respect for them. They're a lot of fun. He was eating great food. They're very welcoming, very hospitable, but they're fearless too. When he said North Africa in, invaded the, the region, they stayed out of the Basque communities. I guess they were known for being fierce fighters. So that's his attitude here. But Mel personally is upset with this. But I guess, I, you know, his curiosity got the better of him and he's letting it proceed. Right. So they lowered this animal down there to uh, the 1500 foot level, because again, that was as much as they had. And then uh, they knew that the line they had could handle it. They think the sheep must have weighed. The, Mel says he doesn't really know because he doesn't know much about sheep, but he thought maybe 150 pounds or so. Mm-hmm. 
and they left it down there for about a uh, half an hour. Also, the you know, the sheep was bleeding, uh, making the the bleat b l e a t noise. Yes, but as they lowered it, they could feel it kind of moving around, but it wasn't making any sound at all. Again, That's that right. that aspect of the story where it's a sound dampening aspect of the whole. Uh, they weren't hearing anything coming out of it. Mel indicated that the sounds were pretty horrific of it going down, but eventually they became silent. Right. Nothing coming out of the box, but the movement, there was still movement with the box. So when they reached the end of the line, the 1,500 feet line, Mel actually described a, a almost static electricity kind of feeling on the line that they could feel up at the top. And that's where they left it, as we said, for about half an hour, and then they decided to bring it back up. So they're cranking it up. It's a ton of work. It's heavy. It's a long way to go. I mean, this is over a fifth of a mile. They had a winch. So they're bringing it back up. And like, yes, like you said, they had a winch, but he indicates cranking away. So I think it's an actual hand winch with uh, gears, Mm -hmm. which, you know, Mm -hmm. you, you have a mechanical advantage on it, but it's still a lot of work, especially for that much line. So they're bringing it up and they get it up to the surface and they bring the box over away from the hole. There's nothing going on. There's no life in it or emanating from it. Again, he's describing sort of the silica, the desiccant, uh, the D, which you use to uh, extract humidity from closed containers. That's what it felt like on the outside of the box. And so they open it up and the sheep is clearly deceased. Right. The outside of the sheep looks untouched, right? That's right. There's no marks. There's uh, nothing they could see. It just doesn't look alive. And uh, clearly it's, uh, it's passed away. So now it's time essentially to take a look, try to figure out what has killed it. And the Basques, as he said, they're pretty good at butchering sheep. This is what they do. They know their way around it. So they start to open this poor animal up. And as they start opening it up, it's not what they're expecting to find inside. Apparently, there was some kind of gel, like a huge sort of tumor inside taking up the entire length of the body cavity and on right. top of that it looked cooked in a way the interior of it yes this is uh well yeah disgusting yeah. but also uh mel at this point is disgusted he's not a sheep herder yeah. uh he doesn't butcher animals for food these folks are very skilled at it so they have no qualms about it and uh they dissect the sheep as if they were butchering it for meat And that's what they notice is that it looks like it's been cooked from the inside. And what made me think of it is like, well, what would do that perhaps? Microwave energy? What cooks something from the uh, inside out? And the other thing is that Mel was expecting some kind of smell. And he said it didn't smell like anything except ozone, which was an interesting observation or an interesting aspect of this fictional story. It smelled like ozone, and the internal organs of the sheep looked like they'd been jellied. And in place of the organs where they should be was this, what looked like he said, uh, he couldn't describe it very well, but like a huge tumor taking up the entire length of the body, maybe two feet in length. And here's the thing, though. It's not just an anomaly from uh, being cooked or anything. They could see the tumor had some movement to it, like a pulsing tumor. Mel says it's not like the beating of a heart, just more of this pulsing. And so at this point, they open it up and there's something inside that appears to be its own independent organism. Mel describes it like a, quote, fetal seal, end quote, about 18 inches long with flippers. A pinniped, yeah. And he says... Yeah. And he's like, I'm saying it's a seal. I have no idea what it was. I I can't figure it out. And he can see that its eyes are opening, its flippers are moving. And they noticed, I guess, that it seemed like it was checking them out as much as they were checking it out. With its eyes. Yeah. Yeah. He said he felt like it was studying them. Yes. Checking them each out individually as they stood around examining it. It was examining them with a consciousness, with, a, with intelligence, but, as Mel described, with eyes that they all agreed looked human. Not like round seal eyes. And as he says to Art, like, you know what dog's eyes look like, you know what cat's eyes look like. These look like human eyes. And they were, 
well, at this point, art is disgusted. <laughs> yeah, hearing this, story. everybody's disgusted. We're disgusted. Yeah, and it's like well, insane. if you hear Mel, his voice is shaky at this point. Yeah, like he's having trouble relaying the story, and he says, "Like, look, just even telling you about this is uh, making me a little queasy." And so, something to consider with all that is that if you think this is fictional, then Mel is also a good actor. Yeah. He's a good storyteller, yeah. you know, like the, who could do all the character voices and all that. He sounds a little bit upset, not too much, but just, yeah, that this is, this memory of this happening is upsetting, but also profound in a way that he can't explain. And that, imagine this, no one's ever seen this kind of thing before. This has never been described, that something extraordinary is happening with this pinniped, this fetal seal-like creature with the human eyes. And it separated itself from the tumor of whatever this uh, <laughs> this placenta it was in. It removed itself, and it had something of like an umbilical cord, but it didn't need any help. And so they had uh, backed away to a little bit of a distance, but they were also curious in that they're standing around this thing, and it's like they can't take their eyes off it. And I think they stood around staring at it for about two hours, weirdly. But as he said, Mel felt like he was in the presence of something extraordinary. It was almost like a religious feeling. And at that point, they just they just left it on the table. So whatever this creature is, which is about 18 inches long with flippers on it, and it's looking at them with human eyes, this exchange goes back and forth where they're studying it, it's studying them. Mel says it looked directly at him as it kind of starts to struggle towards the edge of the table. And as he says, with this spiritual feeling almost, he got a feeling like it had contact with him. It was connecting with him, you could say. And then this feeling came over him. He felt a compulsion to go pick it up and place it on the ground. Interesting storytelling here. So as he goes to pick up this thing, as expected, his hands were slimy from the goo that it was encased in. And he says he has, uh, again, no vocabulary to describe this. And that's when he said, this thing smelled like ozone. So he places it on the ground. And again, they all look at this thing. I, I think he said for about two hours, it was a long exchange. So as this thing was on the ground, Mel describes that whatever this thing is, it had given him, Mel, and the other Basque shepherds the most compassionate look they had ever seen from any face just the way the eyes were looking at them. And as it waddles towards the hole, Mel and the others feel comfortable with it. Like it seems it wants to go back into the hole. And then it makes its way to the ledge. I guess it flippers its way up to the lip of the, uh, the opening there, the collar. And it sits on that ledge for about an hour. And so after this thing has been sitting on the ledge of the metal retaining wall collar of this hole, it finally slowly nods at them and turns around and it goes back in. And this is the cinematic moment for me. It kind of turns, it looks at Mel and gives him adios partner. And then I guess slithers back down into the hole. We don't know. <laughs> Scott yeah. I did, what, about it this jumped. Like, did, did it, it just like do a, a, a yeah, yeah. belly flop? Uh, did it uh, head dive? Did it go in like a seal? I feel like it, you know, did, I want to uh, think that it went or? in kind of like those ladies used to go on the edge of the pool in a Busby Berkeley movie. Right. The, oh yes. The, uh, the hands go yeah, over the side kinda... and it was like, so long and thanks for all the fish. Or actually nothing because it uh, it yeah. just came into existence or was birthed. Or you killed my mother, <laughs> I'm out of here. My alien mother, yeah. Speaking of alien, was it something that uh, just used the sheep as an incubator? Okay, let's just say that we're almost yeah, to the let's conclusions. Not jump ahead we're if almost to them. I've got to stop interrupting <laughs> right. on that. All right. Oh, boy. Well, uh, Scott and I, as well as Mel, are drained telling yes. this tale. Mel says that he's like, I just art, I'm just drained. And art's like, yeah, I'm drained hearing yeah. about this. It just, it's like, because it's this point of like, what are you talking about? What? Yeah. What? This is insane. Yeah. It just gets crazier and crazier. Yes, which is also why we love this story. But how far can it go? How far how f <laughs> can it go? It does go a little bit further. Yeah, it does go a little bit further because, uh, of course, uh, once again, throughout all these interviews, Art says, I suppose you got no photos of this. Or just like, did you get anything? He's like, well, 
No, I did not. Because uh, he thought at first, maybe take some photos of this. And then he thought, well, if this is not my place to do this. Look, this is not my property. It's not my hole. It's not Mel's hole anymore. This is another hole. It doesn't belong to Mel. And this is on land that is public land, but it's also special to the Native Americans, and it's also special to the Basque. And he felt, oh, look, I don't really have any right to publicize this other than we believe it should be studied. And I think eventually where he, he kind of leaves it is that, well, this should be studied by scientists. I think I finally got the Basque folks on board with having at least scientists. You don't want to, because the military comes in and then it's like E.T., right? They, uh, they chase you around yeah. until you turn gray. So at this point, though, he's saying, of course not. And again, yes, it's convenient. He has no photos of this, and he won't give out the location other than to say, I think it's near Reno. So it's northern Nevada. Reno is one point and probably another uh, another town not too far off where it's located. But he doesn't want people coming to this land, even though it's BLM I, land, uh, to trounce the place. And, I still think it's going to be, and I don't feel like I'm giving anything away. Yeah. I think it's probably going to have proximity to Winnemucca. That's what I think. Because mm -hmm. of the, there's a strong Basque presence there. That's northern Nevada. Right. You know, but not immediate. It could be anywhere within hundreds of miles of there. But that, that yeah. seems like that yeah. might be a focal point for the region in right. terms of the right. Basque presence and, and everything else he's talking about. Well, we're not done yet, folks. We're very close. So hang in there. Because Mel thinks that this encounter with this seal-like creature, this seal fetus, this pinniped fetus. Wait, I'm sorry. What's that word he keeps saying? Pinniped. You never heard that? No, That's the, the term that Mel uses a lot. Yeah, look it up. Google it right now. Head. Right. Wikipedia. Any of various carnivorous aquatic uh -huh. mammals of the suborder or superfamily, pinnipedia, having flippers as organs of locomotion and including the seals and the walrus. Yeah, there you go. You learn something new every day. Yes, uh, especially ones that crawl out of a hole where there's probably no water and it's a gelatinous alien right, fetus. Right, right. Continuing on, though, Mel claims that, uh, well, he was diagnosed with six months to live with esophageal cancer. Okay. And he said, well, when they tell you six months, that's hopeful. And uh, he was not very hopeful. And he thinks the seal has healed him somehow with that kind of connection. And that maybe that's what the nod was. Get well soon, brother. I'll see you on the flip side. Or on I mean, the flipper the flip side. side. The upside yeah. down. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, would you, uh, yes, would you like to describe this, uh, the rest of this? Because, uh, yeah, again, it was like a, a tumor. He handled it. It stink. It, it didn't stink. Ozone doesn't really smell no. bad. It smells weird, but it doesn't smell bad. It smells weird. If you ever had a... Uh, yeah, well, you if you've, you've ever been struck by lightning, shop, you know what ozone smells like or about to be. And if you've ever, uh, if you have one of those ozone air cleaners too, they, they kind of make that smell. That's what yeah. I was going to say. You should know this. If you go to a marine shop... Yeah. Uh, where they sell marine supplies, they often have an ozone generator for, I, I did get rid of mildew yes. and mold aboard a boat, right? Yeah. But I guess what I'm going to bring, I'm going to rewind folks to here and just say, we have suggested that artifacts or the herbs related to Mel's original hole were able to bring people back from the brink who were in hospice mm -hmm. care for HIV now this hole in Nevada is curing Mel of his six months to live esophageal cancer. Well, the, the gummy bear seal is, let's be clear. That's well, we don't feeling. know that. I mean, we... No, you don't know it. But he may have uh, be emanating special properties that he, uh, you know, absorbed from the yeah, hole. Yeah, but or... we don't know. We don't know. It could have been anything. Could have been camping next to the metal flange. I mean, there's a lot of things, yeah, that a lot of events yeah. that happened that were anomalous that could have contributed to, if you believe any of this at all, to curing him from his esophageal cancer. It could be the delicious healing properties of paranormal mutton. No, I go. don't, I don't know, I don't but all of this that, is but... too wild to be believed, except there's more. So as Mel's interview is ramping up, he announces that he's going away from civilization uh, about mid-March, the year this interview takes place. And it reminded me of Colin Andrews talking about his crop circle research and that he would kind of said everything and found out everything he needed to know and wanted to know. Uh, there's a lot of mysteries, but he had some ideas, but it was time for him to take a break, to be reflective, to be quiet, his quiet time, which we totally understand. And 
many yeah, times. Yeah, I call that I Sunday. feel like starting that right Ugh, now. Boy, yes, I tell I, you, after that story, <laughs> I need some quiet time for sure. Mel is going away. He's in contact with the Basque, so he's in good relation with the Native Americans in the area who want to study and exchange knowledge about the local herbs there. And to put a finer point on that, as he's about to leave for a little bit of a break, he's not going totally away. They can still get a hold of him. But as he's going away, that mask elder that we told you about, the great grandfather, as he said, he clasps his hand, Mel's, and he puts something into it. And again, this is also a very a cinematic yes. moment here. So keep that in mind. And he doesn't know what it is. And I think it's like, uh, you know, one of their last get togethers. And of course, uh, the Basques like to have fun. They're very good at it. And there's good food, barbecue, good wine, good music. And this great grandfather had given him a gift as a little parting thing because they told him all about this, right? About everything that they'd done. And he said, he just took it in stride, like, mm-hmm, yeah, the hole's weird, you know? And he, he didn't speak a whole lot of English, mostly spoke the Basque language, but they, were able to communicate, he and Mel, enough that he just said like, yeah, there's something special about that, almost spiritual. And he, he didn't phase him <laughs> that there's a, a slime uh, seal that had uh, popped out of a sheep. You know, that that moment reminds me of uh, Thunderheart when Ted Thin Elk oh, yeah. hands something over to Val Kilmer in that movie. This is a great movie right. if you haven't seen it. But. but it is that cinematic moment, and this happens to him. And, of course, as they're having their evening festivities, the other Basque uh, folks say, like, well, aren't you going to look at what, you know, great-grandfather gave you? And he's like, okay, yeah, I guess I should. You know, it's that thing where you want to open the present when you get yeah. home. Yeah, So he looks at it, and what it is is another red Chinese lucky money envelope. And he opens it up, and guess what's inside? A few Roosevelt dimes from 1943. Well, there we go. And if you go as this being true, uh, well, great-grandfather just, the attitude was, you need to have these. Now, here's the thing. They didn't know about Mel's other red envelope of uh, Chinese lucky New Year's money. Uh, they didn't know about the other dimes. Right. So that's the cinematic connection, yeah. right? Is that uh, here's another dime. It's like, what's going on there? Are these dimes just falling out of uh, another dimension, another parallel universe where Roosevelt had passed away pre-1943? Who knows? Did the, did the war turn out differently than we thought? Is this something about the, the man in the high castle, the Philip K. Dick story, where it occurs in 1962, 15 years after the end of the war, in 1947, where Imperial Japan and Nazi Germany divide up the United States because they are the winners. Is that some other alternate universe uh, where that happens? And what's going on here? So you don't make the dimes until the president is passed away. But also, I don't think that the Japanese or the Germans would be interested in, in minting American coins because Mel wondered, does the B stand for Berlin? Yeah. I don't know. You'd probably see some despot's face on the dime. Right. Uh, so there's another set of dimes out there. There's a connection made, and they are unknowing of Mel's other dimes. So one last little anecdote to relay here before we finally wrap this thing up and uh, with our conclusions and thoughts about it overall. And send it down the send hole. Send it down the hole. And this is the story about the fire and ice, or you might remember that uh, mm. one of the gentlemen that Mel was with took some of that ice home to put in his wood stove to keep his little cabin warm. Yeah, why not? It's practical. It's free. So he takes it home and he's got it in the wood stove. Time goes by. It keeps burning. It doesn't go out. It's keeping the cabin warm. Eventually he decides to, he's got a kettle up on top of the stove and he's got water in it. And he mostly wants to humidify the air because he's having skin problems. Apparently it's very dry. The air out there is really dry and yeah, he's having, yeah. he, he's trying to create some humidity in the cabin. And he realizes that when the steam is coming out of the kettle, instead of going up, it's being sucked down into the stove and he can't quite figure that out. And this keeps happening, and he just can't get the humidity up in the cabin. So as time goes by, he keeps this stuff inside the wood stove burning. He goes out, lives his life, does his, his duties, whether he's uh, sheep herding or whatever it is that he's up to. He comes back home one day, and his wood stove has collapsed down through the floor of the cabin to the ground a couple of feet down. And he's like, 
what in the world? He can't figure out why it happened, but it's still burning. It's still hot. So uh, according to Mel, he decides, you know, he's got to fix the ventilation on it. So he just adds a few more feet to the chimney pipe for it that's going mm. out of the mm-hmm. roof of the cabin. Yeah, these guys are kind of foolhardy. Yeah. They're not afraid of anything yeah. and uh, maybe not really thinking this through, but hey, come on. It's like I said, free heat. It's free heat. But here's the thing. It's not done doing what it's doing. It keeps sinking and it sinks and sinks over the course of the next couple of weeks. One day the guy comes home, the cabin has completely collapsed around it. It's now seemingly four or five feet into the ground. This is the China syndrome, folks. This is a nuclear (laughs) meltdown in some ways. This thing just keeps going down into the ground, and he winds up having to leave the property. Right. And after he has left the property, it turns out that some folks show up to try and deal with it, and they're not folks that he knows. Uh, no. So now, of course, it makes me wonder, like, uh, were those not uh, ice cubes or the ice cubes suddenly turned into Thor's hammer? Yeah. Forged from the, the heart of a neutron star that's dead. I can't, I can't remember the, uh, uh, mythos. <laughs> somebody, <laughs> cer- certainly somebody will. You so don't know the MCU, canon. Uh, yeah, you're just yeah, made no, no, it was, millions it, of people angry. Well, uh, yeah, luck, folks. In this case, these cubes, whatever they turned into, are they just so heavy that they're pushing their way through the floorboards, as he said. It became about uh, is it uh, weight five feet though, down. or is it permanent heat output? Maybe it's just the the fact that it, it never melted. cools down. I think it has something to do. Again, we're just going along with this, folks. Like yeah. it's real. Yeah, if, if <laughs> if this, you believe if this, any of this at all? Because <laughs> it's. I know it sounds outrageous. Well, now it does sound like uh, something from the MCU, right? Yeah, yeah. Did these cubes turn into some sort of infinity stones here? Uh, space, mind, reality, power, ice, and mutton. Pick your color. I think it has something to do with weight, though. Did it turn into something else? Now, here's something that's been debunked. I think nobody ever really said that metals taken close to the hole turned into other metals. We said that at the very beginning because that is part of the lore. And as we conclude here and do our uh, wrap-up, we'll go over what are some of the bigger misconceptions about this story because... Like anything you might like, uh, people are very fierce and prideful about the rules of any MC or DC character. There's things that they do, there's things that are canon, and then there's things that are uh, just conjecture and not really part of this myth. So in this case, though, what they know is that this thing is first crashed through the hearth and the floorboards. And when he came yes. back later, as it was described, again, I think this is great sci-fi, is that this thing is now five feet into the dirt because this is a very uh, modest cabin, you could say. That's right. Not very, you know, well-constructed. Look, he's, they're just yeah, he's basically squatting, cheaperning. by the way. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're cheaper. They just need some shelter for the moment. And after, I think, a week or so of just letting this thing sit there, they came back and there was really nothing left except it looked like swirls of wood dust that were colored, that this thing had disintegrated the wood But in a fashion that perhaps if all the moisture had been sucked out of the wood, that somehow that's the going theory that those cubes turned into some kind of material that eventually absorbed all water or perhaps solidified it. And so uh, as it was described, this young bass guy uh, said that, you know, he had furniture in there, which is painted in different colors. He could see the different colors of wood dust or what looked like dust. That was the only thing left and mixed up and swirl. Like everything had been atomized, particleized, and that's all that was left. And so they decided like, ah, I'm just going to go build another cabin now. So just leave that mess there and walk away. However, <laughs> word has gotten out that there's a problem here. His name was not associated with the cat. He was squatting on whatever land this was on, apparently. It was just Mm -hmm. shelter for him. And so he comes back out, and from a safe distance, he notices a team of people swarming around it. Didn't know if they were military. Looked like they might be. They had brought a crane. And so they are now trying to get what's left of the stove out of the ground. It appears to be five or six feet down into the ground, still burning, theoretically, or doing whatever it's doing. Mm -hmm. And the first crane can't lift it. And so then they've got more cranes. It's not clear how many, but the one thing that the eyewitness said was that the last one that they had to use to remove this thing was one of the biggest ones he'd ever seen. Yeah, And it's pulling the, what's left of this man's wood stove out of the ground. 
and putting it onto one of the biggest trucks he's ever seen right. to be hauled away. Uh, if this thing's that heavy, and we're talking about the density of the singularity at the center of a black hole, that kind of mass, which right. is, like I said, going back, extreme physics. What's clever about part of the story is that apparently what they did, because there are Basque observing what's going on here with these authorities, whoever they might be, government, scientists, whatever, Paul Reiser from Stranger Things, whoever these <laughs> folks are, they're figuring out how to get this thing out of the ground because, of course, they want it. It holds secrets. What the deal is, is that they put chains down, like big heavy chains around this thing as far as they, they can, and then they flood it. Mel described it as, you know, this is a rectangular stove. The hole was perfectly rectangular, and the sides of the hole, the dirt itself, was perfectly smooth. Like it had, uh, I don't know, melted or done changed the, the physics and a composition of the dirt around it so that uh, it was maybe almost glass-like, and it just sunk down. So they... So they put the massive chains down there and then they fill it with water and the whole thing fuses together. And that's how, with several cranes now, are able to lift it out of the ground and then placed on the biggest truck that these people had ever seen in their life. Yeah. And where did it go? And did it get there before the truck broke in half? Uh, right. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm thinking like, what, Earth Mover? Like you see at the uh, of those mines where you have to climb up a 20-foot ladder to get to the cab. Yeah. Yeah, who knows? Maybe it's a on its way to, uh, yeah, maybe it's on its way to Lawrence Livermore Labs or one of the many mysterious Air Force bases that hold all kinds of stuff like Hangar 18. Who knows? How do you start to peel that thing apart to find out what makes it tick? You know, we've been on Squarespace for over five years now, and wow, it's really changed a lot in that time. Yeah, that's one of the best things about Squarespace. They are constantly upgrading and improving things behind the scenes and adding features that continue to refine it and make it unparalleled in terms of its power and ability to help you do pretty much anything you want to do with your website. Yeah, one thing that really amazes me is the appointment scheduling they've integrated now. And it's powered by Acuity, which means if you have an Acuity account already, you can keep it. And it's like having your own personal digital assistant who manages your calendar for you. Uh, so let's say you're trying to make yourself available for online classes or sessions with clients. You can use Squarespace scheduling to let people know when you're available or when you're booked. If you have regular online office hours or whatever. So it takes care of all of it. Yeah, that's pretty great. And another Squarespace feature that I was blown away by is the video studio. It makes it super easy to create and produce your own videos with the Squarespace Video Studio app. And, and you don't have to know anything going in. There's a ton of tutorials and guides that walk you through the process. So if you want to build a website with online videos, it's a piece of cake. Yeah, so you've got scheduling, uh, you've got integrated video production, and they also have built-in email campaigns now. So you can manage a list of subscribers right through Squarespace and convert them into customers for your business. So why pay a third-party company to handle that when you can do it seamlessly right within Squarespace? These are just some of the features available to Squarespace users. And that's why we never hesitate to recommend Squarespace as the ultimate destination for the web presence for your business. Not only is it great, it just keeps getting better and better. Look, folks, if you've been waiting to get your business off the ground and onto the web, or even if you just need to upgrade it from what you're using now to something more robust, now is the time. So head on over to squarespace.com slash legends for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use offer code legends to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. That's squarespace.com slash legends for your free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use the offer code legends to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. I'm Aubrey Playtech in Pittsburgh. When we're not looking for local cryptids, we're listening to Astonishing Legends. Now let's get back to the show. Okay, so just for a quick mini recap here what has happened because there's a lot of elements and story elements flying around and real elements if you believe the story that's right once again a bucket of ice has been lowered into the hole a test bag of ice your your sample bag is is outside when they feel like some of it has melted they notice that this ice is not melted we're going to talk about that later because believe it or not 7-eleven convenience store ice is the key to the planet's survival, perhaps. Tuck that under your basque cap. <laughs> Another interesting thing is that how do you communicate with this blob thing, this jelly seal? 
uh, with the human eyes. Well, the Basque have said that this thing's come back to visit them. There are other creatures. It, it went down into the hole after its long, mournful and sentient glance back and forth, and it just lowered itself back in somehow, but they've seen it revisit them, as they say, and they can communicate with it by taking a stereo radio portable and putting it near the hole. And it's almost like an EVP of sorts that's uh, live and continuous. It probably sounds like uh, one of those ghost boxes. Next, the rectangular stove has melted its way through the dirt, creating a smooth-sided rectangular hole that, if unattended, could possibly go to the center of the earth and then out the right. other side. Who knows? Uh, as Scott said, China syndrome. The whole area where the cabin was, the wood, has turned to a powdery dust because perhaps somehow the moisture and other molecules have been sucked out of it. Now, here's something that I'm not sure we've mentioned. Uh, again, this is a lot of rapid-fire info, but Mel was still in contact with some of the folks from his Australia Wombat Project, his Wombat Rescue yes. Project. And I'm not a vet, but I did, of course, hire veterinarians and scientists to help out with his research, and that's who he wants to contact here, people that know him, that he somehow can get involved on this project to help make sense of the Nevada hole. And I believe he said he did contact them. And according to Mel, that apparently Australians were dispatched to the site of the Basque hole. So there is some Australian connection. And again, I, I point that out because if Mel's a real guy, well, obviously he's a real guy. I keep saying that. Like he's, <laughs> like we're reading this and you don't know if it's a, if it's a real guy. Obviously there's a dude, uh, but if, uh, if the story is true, then people know him and have worked with him in the capacity that he claims. That's what I'm saying is that if he's done this, then they know who this guy is, whether his name is Mel or not. Now the Bass contacts there said, yes, authorities, military, he doesn't know, scientists perhaps, military scientists, Paul Reiser, who knows? They show up, a bunch of big equipment, they're now studying this thing, trying to get that burning ice. And like I said, uh, who knows how that uh, molecular structure has been changed, but apparently it's very heavy. So somebody calls in at this point on the show and they ask Mel, good question, does he think that there was any radiation and uh, Mel says, well, none of us got sick, really. And, of course, the, the Basque aren't, uh, or Mel are equipped to test that with a Geiger counter. But apparently there's not people in suits. That's something that Mel would have mentioned, I'm sure. But it doesn't seem toxic in any way. And so perhaps not any radiation coming out of that hole or from the ice itself. So that's also interesting. But there's something that Mel feels has gotten out of control much like Stranger Things. Yeah. <laughs> Something is <laughs> now possibly beyond any government's control or any scientist's knowledge of, and this could be dangerous. So we told you how they got the stove and the ice chunk out of the hole here. So now back to these seal creatures. And again, the Basque have been telling Mel that they've been seeing this thing uh, again, and it's communicating with them. Now, here enters a character into the narrative that Mel briefly describes, but as he describes him, he doesn't know exactly what his name is or even remembers it. And this gentleman is called Red Elk. We're going to talk about him in a little bit because he's super interesting, fascinating character. And apparently Mel does not know him because he he asks Art, is it Red Elk? Is it Red something? There's, a, there's Red in his name. And he was not on the show with Mel. He right. was on Coast to Coast a handful of times on his own, but claiming to have a connection to the hole, knowing where it is and all that. He called these seal creatures rock flyers, I believe. That's, uh, yeah. Is that what it sounded like to you? Yeah, rock flyers. Yeah, absolutely. According to Red Elk, he says, these are creatures that live down in the earth and inhabit different realms, different earths. And from a certain distance, another aspect that goes back to the dimes. This is interesting. Mel says the hole itself from a distance can't be seen. And I'm talking about the metal collar. Right. And like that dime being 15 feet away from that, you can't see it. He says, you can see the Basque and their, their shepherd's huts and, and, and trailers, but you can't see the metal hole, the collar around it. And maybe that has something to do with what we're going to talk about in a little bit, the satellite photos. Is that part of it? Is that a way to excuse yourself why there is no image? But then why would the military blot out the terror server satellite images if it couldn't be seen? But anyway. Well, I mean, to block out the military presence. Oh, there you go. See? Yeah. You're much wiser than Yeah. That. Even if the hole wasn't visible, you definitely want to do, there's nothing to see here. 
We're right. not over here. That kind of thing. <laughs> exactly. Well, Mel thinks the hole has been re-landscaped anyway. Okay. Yeah. Now. Is it some nice shrubs? Some flowering plants? <laughs> just the net, camouflage netting, which is, you know, what really yeah. makes, uh, I, I learned that at uh, Burning Man in, in high wind conditions. It it makes for great, not only uh, uh, shade, dappling mm -hmm. where you get some, you still get some light in. So it's not like a, sitting under a tarp but it lets the wind pass through. So yes, uh, fun indeed. stuff. You can get it at any army surplus store, I'm sure. But it's been camouflaged, obviously, as Mel says. It's like, look, they're they're putting this much effort into it. They're going to be hiding it. And if they use something like that camouflage netting you're talking about, then that would be good because then the wind could still pass through Mel's hole. That's right. In and out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> How many more of these we're going to have to endure? Well, <laughs> listen, folks, here's here's another thing that Scott's going to talk about here. This is a pretty interesting concept, I thought, that if part of a narrative, it involves another narrative. And I'm talking about a real fictional narrative by an author we've probably all heard of, Kurt Vonnegut, and his celebrated book, Cat's Cradle. Because in the book, there is something that's described, and, and again, this is a fictional concept, as, as Mr. Yes. Vonnegut would talk Art do. brought this up. Yes, he did. Right, right. Art has been fooled initially here and there by people calling in, and then those who are probably much younger and in the nose, that's the narrative of a video game. Right, <laughs> right. So, like they, you know, look, come on, we don't, uh, there, there's so many of them. Maybe your son couldn't even keep up. But in the book, Cat's Cradle, there's a substance called Ice-9, which was developed by the military. And the concept in the book is that one of the biggest problems for the military anywhere on deployment and in actions is mud. And so how you do that... Yeah, we just saw this with the Russians in Ukraine. Yeah. Like the, the initial outset, the convoys were stuck in the mud. That's right. They were stuck in the mud. You're talking about late spring conditions, wet mud, it affects everybody. Well, the military figures out like, hey, could is there a way to somehow solidify that? So then mud just turns into hard, compact dirt and we can travel over that. That's the concept of Ice-9. However, if this thing got out of hand, guess what? It's taken water and moisture out of things that should be wet and moist. You could just wreck the earth. Yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> so, if you can't stop it. That's what I'm saying. And here I just made a note to myself while listening is that the way it's being described is that is this, whatever the ice turned into, whatever microbes, organisms that maybe are down in the hole or mingle in the ice or that are already in the ice that you're just drinking. Uh, it's probably filtered. I'm sure you're fine, folks. <laughs> the idea is that whatever this turned into, does this ice, is it a living thing? Like a coral maybe, you know, like is a living thing, but more inanimate or is it sentient? What is this ice doing? And if it did get out of hand, could it be a problem? I'll just talk about it now before I forget. It's kind of like the concept, which is a real concept of the gray goo. Have you heard of that, Scott? Well, only because of you. And actually, no, that's not true. I think I <laughs> right. was familiar with it from a while back. I had forgotten about it when I was, you know, when it, people first started talking about nanoparticles, mm -hmm. I remember reading about it. Yeah. Well, the idea, folks, uh, and I'm just going to do a terrible job of explaining this, but basically it's based on nanotechnology where you have a microscopic little tiny machine that is programmed to take the matter around it and repair itself and create more of itself. Self-replicate and self-repair. Right. If it didn't get the proper instructions, say it didn't get a good firmware update, it would just get out of hand. And if it just kept replicating itself and using the, the natural uh, resources around us, eventually we'd all be smothered in giant piles of what would appear to be gray goo. Yeah. On the microscopic level. And uh, it always right. remember it was the new updated movie of uh, The Day the Earth Stood Still with Keanu Reeves and yes. they basically the monster or the, the giant robots made up of a, you know, a trillion tiny little machines that just devour everything in its path. Yeah. The particle animation that moves like a flock of birds. Yeah. Uh, was a big deal. They were putting <laughs> some version of that in every movie, I including know. in the matrix when they were breaking into Zion and all that stuff. Yes. Or you, you, you zap the bad guy and he turns into a thousand bats or a thousand crows or whatever. So yes, exactly. Uh, fun idea. But the idea here though, is that essentially something getting out of control is something, it's yeah. a process that you've, you're now incapable of stopping or programming. And now it's just doing its thing, which is to solidify, or in the case of 
gray goo just keep replicating. And the idea is that little nanobots may or may not be gray, is so that optically, they just may appear to be like gray goo. And it's unstoppable in the same way that like a lava flow is. It may be slow. You might be able to even see it coming, but there is absolutely nothing that you can do that mankind can do right. to stop that if it's not properly programmed. Yeah, great sci-fi idea and and frightening yeah. and, as a real concept. But that's the Grey Goo is not a comic book idea. It is a real theory that is put forth by scientists. It's like, well, we gotta we gotta watch out for this stuff. Same thing with AI right. getting out of control. Right. Again, we have these uh, seal creatures. These gooey pinnipeds that inhabit the earth with human eyes and, uh, and human consciousness and uh, we're on the on the on something on that level and the basque said through their communications that the seal creature told them to beware of this ice that it can and would destroy the world in a little amount of time hmm. and that i'm not sure that it's humankind or the seal kind uh, can't understand how it works, but it is unimaginable and inexhaustible as a source of power. The seal said the world would be destroyed by the improper and quote, greedy and undisciplined use of the ice and greedy quote. and undisciplined use. I love that phrase. Yeah. I, I actually looked that up because I was like, is this is an original phrase? Because here we got Mel again too. It's not bad at writing prose. Right. If you're coming up with that's like, Greedy and undisciplined use. I wondered if that was borrowed from somewhere. I couldn't find it anywhere. Oh, you with, did search uh, that phrase. Google searches. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, of course, it's a great science fiction, again, and statement talking about the day the Earth stood still. Well, a lot of encounters with aliens. What is the message? You better shape up or you're going to wreck this place and we might not be able to help you or we're going to wreck you before you wreck this place. Yeah. Because you are dispensable. The Earth, with its beautiful resources, is not. So take your pick. You shape up or ship out, or we'll ship it out for you. Here we have a warning that, yes, we could destroy ourselves, or some other force will use this to destroy us, or they will take our place and destroy themselves. So again, great science fiction concepts here. Something else, though, that I didn't look too much into, but you're going to talk about this here in a second, is that Mel said that the Basque were renowned whalers. And yeah. they told Mel that they were the ones who left the whalebone in that tree in Ellensburg at that house. Yeah, and I, I don't think we've actually really touched on that yet. So that might be new information. I can't remember if we talked about it, but there is a house in Ellensburg mm -hmm. in Washington near where Mel says his hole is, or one of them anyway. Right. And the house has a tree in front of it. It was built in uh, 1887 as a parsonage connected to a church. And there's a whalebone that now appears to be growing out of the tree. <laughs> well, the, so it, the, the idea is maybe it was leaned up against it right, a long time ago right. and the tree grew around it. Yes. But I mean, talk about leaving something lying around for a while. I mean, this, and it's something to see. And there's been folks that have come by who know about whales, and uh -huh. uh, but even they can't even agree what type of whale it's from or whether it's a jawbone or, or a rib. Oh, that's fascinating. Uh, yeah. That's been approached by professionals who are like, not quite sure, still there, still sticking out of that tree right. to this day. Wow. And it's big. Like yeah. you could, an adult could walk past between it and the tree trunk. It's very strange. So it's 100 miles from the ocean. 100 miles yeah. from the ocean. Yeah. Uh, in Ellensburg. <laughs> Is it connected? I don't know. But like you're saying, okay, so now we get back to the Basques. Right. Are the Basques connected to all this somehow in some strange way? Or no, that's just, you know, it's like you said, it's the diaspora of where they've settled right. and it's coincidental and it's not connected in any way to Mel's Hole. But yeah. we'll have a link to the house. You see a picture of it. It's it's very cool. There's a, there's a couple of whalebone houses, which I found in our uh -huh. research, that are not this house. They're called the Whalebone House for some other reason. They don't have whale bones in front of them. Mm. So there's a Facebook page that belongs to one that's not this house okay. that's in another part of the country. We'll have the links. You can check okay. it out and see a picture of it, yeah. but it's pretty fascinating. It's a private home yeah. now. These people just live in it and there's a whale bone sticking out of the tree <laughs> in the front yard. <laughs> but it's a real thing. You're confirming that yes, it's, it's a, a real, real thing. thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, somebody had uh, stuck this whale bone, jawbone or yeah. whatever it is, and the Basque told Mel it was stuck there by their people as a marker for some reason. So, yeah. well, uh, getting back to the seal creatures, it is told to the Basque, I believe, by the creatures themselves that they can travel between worlds. And 
get this, other people in other worlds have designs on our world because theirs is so horrible. This is what Mel is relaying here as the message yeah. from the seals. And it's not the seals. There are other quote unquote people, or you could say beings, I guess. And they want our world destroyed so they can move in. And the idea, though, is that, uh, I, th I believe as Mel said... Well, good. <laughs> so then all they have to do is wait around for us to make a mistake, which Exactly, we're because here's the, yeah. here's the sad part, uh, as Mel described, is that their world is so awful. Imagine even if we had a nuclear holocaust and there's a nuclear winter and it's just, it's, it's everything, it's Terminator 3 time, you know, where it's yeah. just a pile of skulls and fire, that that world is even better than what they're coming from. So like, yeah, that's fine. Go ahead, uh, just yeah. do that. That's uh, that's a few <laughs> steps up from where we're living in. It's yeah. so horrible that they're waiting for us to make a mistake, or that this ice gets out of hand, and then they can step in because they believe they can use the ice properly. However, the seal beings uh, believe, yes. like, no, they're fooling themselves too. They're they're going to screw this up. They're going to mess it up, and then everything's going to be ruined and one giant solidified blob. So that's pretty much the end of the story. Yeah, that's where it stops. Mel disappears after this. We don't hear from him anymore and haven't for quite some time now. As we suggested earlier, I think he would be, what, 89 now if he's still alive, mm -hmm. if he was accurate about his age, the one call that he made. And there's been a lot of people, no shortage of people looking for the location of the hole on satellite imagery for quite some time right. now. Yeah. Yeah. We talked about that. We talked about the Terra server expunged image, which is interesting. But I did find, and of course I couldn't, I, I, I lost it, but I mm -hmm. did find a, a posting from someone who worked at Terra server, uh, according to them, on a forum that yeah. was discussing Mel's hole and that image being blocked. And they just said this happened all the time back then. The imagery wasn't complete. It wasn't unusual mm -hmm. for something mm -hmm. to appear to be redacted when really it was just missing data. Right, right. But of course that's a convenient thing to say about it being covered up because it is right over the Monastash Ridge. Yeah. It is pretty much exactly the area that Mel said he was in. Right. So it is, there's a lot of things that are convenient from his side of the story, maybe being a hoax. Mm -hmm. This is a convenient support of his story. Right. Uh, th <laughs> That's that. the point of this. Yes. Yeah. It's convenient yeah. however you look at it. Well, folks, if you're interested in that aspect, there's a, a good short little video that explains the difficulties of looking at something through uh, satellite imagery and then being on the ground and actually trying to find something that's real. If any of you have looked at properties, <laughs> Scott and I have done this a bunch, you look at uh, e even real estate listings and you look at the Google Earth image and then you go there and of course it looks totally different. They're two separate things. Looking at a satellite image from way up above and then you get on the ground and of course nothing translates the same that's right you, you know that perspective is totally different well that's what's happening here and so over the years interest in this has subsided it's been a long time but it has not gone away people have been searching for some kind of satellite imagery of this hole ever since mel was on the air and some people believe they found it. Uh, there's one, uh, there's a good Reddit thread that you know, people believe that they've, they've located it. But there's some problems with their reasoning. And if you take Mel's description as accurate and that he wasn't throwing everybody off, people have searched around the area. Now, what I would say is that logically, again, if you're going to believe Mel, then you want to search within the blotted out squares that he's talking right. about, not somewhere else, right. because then why would the military blot out something? Uh, it's got to be within those squares, right? Well, people have found right. holes in satellite imagery that were north of Ellensburg or yes. all around the region. Northeast. One in particular was marked northeast of there. Right. Uh, one of our own researchers, Bert, found uh, something that looked like a hole, although it's near an area called Lost Spring, and it's and it's further, it's right on the ridge, but it's further away than from where Mel said it was. But it, it is a compelling looking thing, but also just to the right of it is something that says Lost Spring, so it could just be some kind of spring. Right, right. And it's hard to run all that down without going in person. There's a great video summation and also a really good website. It's one of the better ones I've found and yes. uh, one of my favorites here and is essentially a blog for this author named Christopher Hayden. And uh, he's yes. also dabbled in paranormal research. If he's out there listening, if somebody else knows of this guy, uh, feel free to put us in touch just to discuss some stuff. But he's got a collection of books that he's written, and one of them is about Mel's Hole. And he's done a fair amount of research and really good piecing together of the, of the known bits of information. He's got all the calls 
listed on his website. We're going to actually come back and talk about a list of common misconceptions about the story that he's listed and, and try to clarify. But there is also a YouTube video where he analyzes a lot of a lot of satellite imagery. And he says, I've been doing this for decades, spent untold amounts of hours staring at these images. And it's pretty unbiased and straightforward and objective, I think. Yeah. It's a great video. It's only eight minutes, you know, a little over eight minutes long. And right. it explains all the candidates. I When I watched it, I realized that I was seeing every single candidate for the whole that I had seen online in other places. He was Me in too. analyzing yeah. them. Yeah. yeah, he's very thorough. So his name is Christopher Hayden. H a y d e n, and his website is Raiding Oaks, R a i d i n g Oaks, O a k s dot com, and uh, like I said, he's got other books you can check out, and and writing and poems and stuff. But this is one of his books on Mel's Hole. Mel's Hole, an, an endless mystery. That's right. Yes, uh, that's how he introduces it on the webpage for that. But yes, Christopher Hayden, Mel's Hole, an endless mystery. Uh, he's got all the phone calls. He's got the faxes. And he's also got theories, which we're going to touch on, which are the general theories collected about this. Yes. So anyway, that's, I think, one of the better short videos about just the satellite imagery analysis. And what did you come up with a, as a conclusion or analysis about all these photos? I, you know, I don't think they found it. And so, right. which begs the question, does it exist? Uh, right. But also, can you identify something like this from satellite imagery? That's the other thing. The hole that um, our researcher, Bert, found in the Astonishing Research Corps I went, that was the great thing about Google Earth, you know, is there's mm -hmm. a little tape measure thing. You can measure stuff right. no matter what <laughs> yeah, your exactly. elevation is at. You can, yes. it keeps that in track for you. And the one he found was about 12 feet across in the in the rougher picture, but it's conceivable mm -hmm. that it would have been a nine foot hole. But then another one of the ones that uh, Christopher Hayden talks about, it looks like a hole in a satellite image. And then it's obvious when you do the historical satellite images, yeah. it was a pond. And it's and, exactly. and it's been drained. Uh, but when the yeah. water's there, that looks like a black hole from space and certain quality of images. So, and then if any of what Mel is saying is true, if you believe any of this at all, <laughs> and the military <laughs> came, it'd be yeah. a piece of cake. You just put a shed over it and no one would think twice from a space well, shot. Exactly. You know, it's or like, just, just some shrubbery. That's the thing yeah. is that it's easy to cover up. The other problem is that the best images that you can get or that were accessible, at least to him, start in 1998. I believe. Right. And that's a year after this has happened. So if you believe Mel's story, they came in the next couple of days and started working around there. And they, to his knowledge, have covered it up, or at least he would figure that they've camouflaged it. So by 1998, when the images were taken by satellite, and those are the best ones, because before that, it's just basically pixels. Right. Uh, it's really low res. It's hard to make out anything. The other thing is that, uh, as he's, again, I, I thought it was very objective, where it could be a, a stock tub, just water for cows, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And that would reflect the sunlight at certain angles, and it appears either as a bright, weird, anomalous spot in the satellite imagery, or a dark spot, or it could just be an old abandoned spring well that they let the cattle feed from, and that uh, people have thrown junk into, just like regular Mel's hole. And... If you look at it from one elevation, as you said, and you get down now with uh, a couple of years later, and you look at it, it's nothing. Right. There's nothing there. So it was just, an uh, again, a reflection aberration, something that was temporary put up by a rancher or yeah. a farmer, and yeah. then now it's just gone. And again, easy to conceal. Also, right. just quickly, I did want to say that Christopher Hayden's book is available as a paperback at barnesandnoble.com. I just ordered it. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll put a link up for that yeah. if anybody wants to buy it. But you can also get to it from his webpage. I'm I'm betting based on the way his site is built and the way he's written about this that it's very well sourced and a well written fair look at this story. Exactly, and one thing that uh, he points out again with the imagery is that uh, there is a likely candidate because there's at least two outbuildings, something that Mel described yes. on the property. Yeah, and there is a location that could be a hole, but he wants to say, look. No one's ever found it. If it's real, that's right. It's never been positively identified by anyone. So we no have one to has proven that. they found it. There are people that say they exactly. have or have seen. That's it. right. Yes. Right. Well, people can say anything. So you know, for or against ideas like this, and as he says, like, well, objectively, no one knows. And right. he just thinks that some of the reasoning that he's seen from other sites, it's like, well, look, this is nowhere near what Mel described. The one pin in the map of logic here is that it should be within those squares. So yeah. he said the most likely place I was just talking about is he said it's just outside 
one of those two blotted out regions. Right. But it is within the general area. And the other thing that Mel always said is that it's on or at least adjacent to Manastash Ridge. Yeah. And these other places that people say, like, oh, I swear to God, it's 100% here. It's like nowhere near. Yeah. So, again, you could be throwing them off. But also the, you, you have to realize that it's the other candidate is good because it's near a road. The Mexican fellow would uh, is not going to carry loads of tires uh, by hand, yeah. three hundred yards. No, he's going to back his truck up to it. That's as right, as close as he can and get. Yeah. The same thing with the refrigerators and all the other uh, garbage. So there, it's got to be close to a road or at least accessible, but not on one of the main roads. So there's a lot of factors that people have been looking for, and that's as close as anyone has gotten. Yeah. And, and then it. the one in Nev- Nevada is invisible. From more than 15 feet away or 10 or 15 feet away. <laughs> That's right. That's right. It's got magical properties. Yeah. You're not going to find it anyway. Yeah. So even a satellite imagery, imagery, it's going to be an FDR dime from 1943, which doesn't exist except in a parallel universe. It's going to be with J.K. Simmons in an episode of Counterpart. Yes. Right? That was a good parallel show. I was universe. sad it didn't yeah. get picked up. It was really good. I know. That, that happens a lot nowadays. Well, let's see what science has to say about this, or at least one scientist, because, again, a lot of scientists aren't going to bother with it. <laughs> it's kind of a silly <laughs> story, but at least one did. Now, as we were saying, this has been featured in the local regional news out of Seattle, Ellensburg. It's been picked up uh, by the Spokesman Review and the Spokane Chronicle. Because there's an enduring aspect to the story. Why are we talking about it now? Why are people digging this thing? Literally uh, and figuratively. Because there's something that captures the imagination. As I said, there's a primal aspect about us and our connection to the earth and the dirt from whence we came or whatever. But the fact that there's a hole that's bottomless is just such a fascinating concept. And is that possible? Well, it's made a lot of people obsessed to a degree. So there's been a lot of news stories that were reported. And one I'm going to talk about here comes from an article titled Getting to the Bottom of Mel's Hole by Mike Johnston. He's a senior writer at the Ellensburg, Washington Daily Record. And this was originally published in March uh, 31st, 2012, and updated again February 4th, 2014. And, and keep in mind when they talk about dates and time spans that, yeah, the last updating this was uh, 2014. And They're probably referring to 2012. So that's what we're going to cite from here. And again, there was a new special done by Como TV News in Seattle, K-O-M-O. That aired on February 7th, and I think that was in 2012. So like I said, over the decades, there's been a few news stories here and there regionally. So, But let's talk to the one scientist who bothered to take a look at this. Uh, There was at least one geologist who was captivated by the story of Mel's Hole, enough to go try and check it out for himself. And this fellow is a well-respected Washington State geologist named Jack Powell. Jack Powell, though, thinks he found a real, more normal hole near Ellensburg that may have been the inspiration for the story. So already I'm on board. Like, let's, can you find something close? Right. Did that, did that spark an idea by somebody just really creative? Yeah, and yeah. Wanted, wanted to uh, tell a tale in a very popular overnight radio talk show? Well, this is what Mr. Powell had to say as described by Mel on Coast to Coast AM, is that, quote, it's geologically impossible. Right. Well, okay, we all, I think, knew that. But <laughs> but here's the thing. It starts from there, and everything about this hole is impossible yeah. to a degree. Yeah, that's true. He also said it couldn't be deeper than 100 feet, or a lava tube wouldn't be deeper than 100 feet, I think. Exactly. Yeah. We have some figures that he's going to mention in this article here, but the article states that Powell has worked as a exploratory geologist for petroleum companies. He's taught geology at CWU for 11 years, and he's worked with the Department of Natural Resources, the DNR, for more than 20 years. And again, he says he found a hole that he personally knew about. And again, those figures there about the years, that's coming from 2012. So add another right. uh, 10 on there. So Jack Powell is apparently from Ellensburg. And he was listening to that first interview with Mel Waters when he was driving back from an out-of-county task. And at this time, Powell uh, was 62 years old, and he said, quote, it got my interest in a funny kind of way. Now, I knew Art Bell stuff is basically Sasquatch and UFOs and the like, but it was sort of entertaining. So Powell had grown up in the Kittitas Valley and played near an old gold mine shaft when he was a kid. And he said this shaft, he uh, said, went down at an angle into a field northwest of Ellensburg. So again, we got that northwest connection. And I wonder if those satellite photos of something that's northwest is of this hole. Right. 
Now, there's been a lot of mining around there, and these things get filled up, but there's usually some kind of depression. I think this hole, you can still drop stuff into, and it goes down a long ways. It was estimated by Powell that the shaft that he's talking about was at least 90 feet deep or more, and maybe as deep as 300 feet when it was active as a mine. So still no 15.1 miles. Yeah. And at this point, of course, uh, yeah, and it goes down at an angle because it, it's mining. you got to bring stuff right. out of it. You know, it's harder to bring stuff straight out of the ground. So when Jack Powell heard Mel tell Art that he thought this hole was at least 80,000 feet at Manashtash Ridge, he had to stop listening. <laughs> <laughs> and I know what that's like because a lot I of people say that about listening. us. Like, yeah. man, when you guys, yeah, 30 minutes in, I wasn't buying this. I just turned it off. Well, uh, and that's fine. But here are some deep hole facts that Jack Powell knew about that he relayed to the reporter. Now, he knew that the deepest mine shaft in the world was 12,672 feet deep, and the deepest known cavern was 7,188 feet. Now, the Russians drilled the deepest borehole that went down 40,230 feet in 1989. We may have said some of those uh, figures in part one. I can't remember exactly, but... Can I uh, drill down on this a little bit? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yes, the, the one in Russia, the Kola, I'm not sure I'm saying it right, but it's K-O-L-A, super yeah. deep borehole. Uh -huh. I'll read this excerpt on this from it here. The Kola super deep borehole, deepest man-made hole on Earth, deepest artificial point on Earth, 40,230 mm -hmm. feet, 12.2 kilometers. Wow. Construction is so deep, locals swear you can hear the screams of souls tortured in hell. It took the Soviets <laughs> almost 20 years to drill this far, but the drill bit was still only about one-third of the way through the crust to the Earth's mantle. When the project came Jeez. grinding, very clever, to a halt in the chaos <laughs> of post-Soviet Russia. And there's a picture of it from this article. We'll link to it that I'm quoting right here. Yeah. Where it's just capped off now. There's like an abandoned building around it. So it's just a tiny little pipe right. in the ground, you know? And yeah. then it's so crazy. Borehole yeah. 10X. Like borehole 10X. Borehole it also 10X. says the yes. drilling was mm -hmm. stopped in 1992. Now get this. This is, I thought was important. Mm -hmm. That's why I wanted to share it. When the temperature reached yeah. 180 degrees Celsius or 356 oh, degrees yeah. Fahrenheit. That's Ouch. at 12 kilometers down, so 40,000 feet. That's getting up to north of 350 degrees at just seven miles, roughly, which mm -hmm. is not mm -hmm. even anywhere near as far. That's only half the distance to the depth of Mel's right. hole. So it says here, following the collapse of the Soviet Union... There was no money to fund such projects. And three years later, the whole facility right. was closed down. And now the desolate site is a destination for adventurous tourists. Now it continues though, it mentions this one in Germany, a German yeah. borehole. I'm actually not sure what the depth of that one is. I don't know if I have it here, but there was a Dutch artist named uh, Lot Given. I'm not sure I'm saying that right, but it's L-O-T-T-E-G-E-E-V-A-N, mm -hmm. who lowered a microphone into that one in a protected thermal yeah. shield and it picked up a deep rumbling sound scientists could not explain. A rumbling that made her, quote, mm. feel very small. It was the first time in my life this big ball we live on came to life and it sounds haunting. Uh, she says, some yeah. people thought it did sound like hell. Others thought they could hear the planet breathe, end quote. We did find that. She has no. that posted. Uh, we can't include it here. That's her intellectual property, but we do have a yeah. link to it. It's on Vimeo. Anyone can listen okay. to it. It's very freaky to hear. So, um, And I can't remember the depth of that one, but it's- What it's, about the screams of the damned from Oh, hell? yeah, that's the whole can urban legend that? thing. We talked about that before. That one, I think, has been debunked. But anyway, okay. so those are the, those are the man-made <laughs> ones. There's yeah. also the devil's hole. Yes. Right? From Wikipedia. Devil's Hole is a geothermal pool within a limestone cavern in the Armagosa Desert in the Armagosa Valley of mm -hmm. Nevada, east over the Armagosa Range and Funeral yeah. Mountains from Death Valley. It is at an elevation of 730 meters or 2,400 feet above sea level. Mm -hmm. The water is a constant temperature of 91 degrees Fahrenheit or 33 Celsius. The surface area mm. of Devil's Hole is about uh, 22 meters long by three and a half meters wide, or 72 feet by 11 and a half. Yeah. This is interesting because it says that the Devil's Hole branches down. It goes down into these caverns. The water is that consistent warm temperature. Mm -hmm. But the bottom has never been mapped. However, geologists uh, say these caves were formed about a half million years ago and that the pool down there has experienced activity from earthquakes in Japan, Indonesia, Mexico, and Chile. Mm -hmm which have been linked to extremely small-scale tsunamis. But they do think they have a depth for it. Devil's Hole descends approximately 160 feet through what is termed the main chamber before reaching a narrow opening referred to as the funnel, 
Through this opening lies a much larger chamber of the cavern system known as Acre's Chasm. Mm. Acre's Chasm is approximately 300 feet in length, 40 feet in width, and has a bottom approximately 260 feet below the surface. Wow. Yeah. So that's the Devil's Hole, yeah. not to be confused with Mel's Hole. Right. And that covers the other uh, deep hole, you know, the Russia one anyway. So just I just wanted yeah. to expand on that a little bit because I, I think I thought it was Did you something find, people should know. Uh, any evidence from an email sent to us by a listener years ago when we did Huska Castle talking about the Mormon hole or the angels, no, the I, angels hole or there, it has a name for it. And I'm just yeah. vaguely back in my memory. If that person writes us again, we'll, uh, we'll talk about it briefly in the next cold open, I think. But yeah, there was something about it, which could be its own episode. And it has a lot to do with Mormon settlers coming out and somebody being yeah. directed to find and then protect this. That was more of a chasm too. I think it was uh, not so much a drilled or round hole, but just this opening within which I believe there were treasures of some kind. And, and there was some spiritual importance to this uh, chasm. Anyway, just, yes. just reminded me, we'll look into that later. But what you're talking about here is important too, geologically speaking, if we're just going to talk about real stuff uh, <laughs> that we know of and geology, in that it's important where Mel said this hole was, because the geology is different under the ground, depending where you are, just in Washington state. Now, getting back to the article, Powell is quoted as saying, if they had said over the radio, it was on the north side of the valley. Well, I might have stayed with the program for a while longer. I was thinking the hole I knew about was somehow being made into Mel's Hole, said Powell, who has 30 years experience exploring the geology of eastern Washington and especially lower Kittitas County and Menashtash Ridge in detail. And so Powell says, geologically and physically, it's not possible for a hole to be that deep. It would collapse into itself under the tremendous pressure and heat from the surrounding strata. Uh, he concluded, whoever Mel Waters was, he probably knew about the hole northwest of Ellensburg that's on private property, fenced with barbed wire, and is not too far from state DNR lands. He goes on to quote, I suppose this Mel Waters used the real hole as a kind of inspiration for making up this mysterious one on Manashtash Ridge. So geologist Jack Powell, he didn't think much about that hole yeah. <laughs> after that yeah. Coast to Coast episode until he was contacted by a member of a Seattle area discussion group, an online chat club that was studying Mel's hole back in 2001. And Powell said uh, they were hoping he could give them the geologic information about the area as they were coming to Manashtash Ridge to search for Mel's Hole. So Powell agreed to talk to them so he could accurately give them sound geological knowledge and data about the area they're going to explore, uh, about the local geology, because that's what he does. He's a professor, right? He, he wants to teach. Right. So yeah. they all meet up on a Saturday, and it, it seems at the Copper Kettle Restaurant, I think, I'm, I think I've been there, <laughs> where Powell gave his standard layman scientific overview lecture on the geology of Kittitas County and details of Menashtash Ridge. And Powell also told them about the gold mine shaft that he thought was the inspiration for Mel's Hole, which he told them he didn't think existed on Menashtash Ridge. That's him telling him, like, I, I don't know if Mel's Hole's real, so just... <laughs> Yeah. Get that from my professional yeah. opinion. And he said, well, they thanked me and they served me up some pie they had, uh, but they wouldn't let go of the possibility of Mel's Hole. Well, of course not. You're on a mission to find the hole. Yeah, yeah. That group later formed the Seattle Paranormal Society. So that's interesting. Oh, there we go. Yeah, and so uh, the article ends with saying, uh, Powell, you know, acknowledged that Mel's Hole has become a surprisingly long-lived legend based on no evidence at all. Quote, it looks like it's indelible now. You can't disprove a negative. It's probably with us forever. Mm, well put. Uh, yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I like that. So, Like many astonishing legends. Well, here's another scientist's viewpoint on this. And again, this is uh, by senior writer Mike Johnston from the Ellensburg Daily Record. And of course, I want to bring this up and mention this because guess what science it is? It's social science. And it's sociology, because guess what, folks? <laughs> this is an urban legend, right? Well, Mike Johnson talks to Pamela McMullen Messier, assistant professor in Central Washington University's sociology department. And she said that legends like Mel's Hole give people the opportunity to test the mysterious against scientific fact. 
she said here, which I liked, is that it makes me think of the In Search of TV show, where we have the wonderment of watching someone else go off to search for the legends and slash myths from the safety of our living rooms. And, and what do we typically find? That they're not real. But we enjoy the chase and hold on to the fantastic idea that there might be something unknown out there. Well, I would disagree that not everything is not real, but yes, a lot of it right, cannot right. be proven. So and she says, well, it's uh, humans like to solve problems as a social group and to have conversations to vet out various explanations. Quote, I think the added dimension of Mel's Hole is that we can't verify its location. So it gives folks a sense of adventure in attempting to seek it out. An assistant professor in CWU's Department of Psychology, Rolf Greenwald, says, so many urban legends, upward of a quarter, have a disgust factor. Research that manipulated the level of disgust found that people tend to repeat or recall myths that have a higher disgust factor, he said. Right. Yeah, it's got the sheep thing and the the, the, yeah. the bulging tumor. Yeah. It elicits a strong emotional response, which makes people want to retell it, but also want to hear about it. And it keeps right. the story going. It makes them remember it. It fuels itself. Yeah, it's like the pet rat. Uh, you know, <laughs> you go down to a vacation in Mexico, the family comes back with a chihuahua, turns out it's a giant rat. <laughs> There's a disgust factor. Or the missing kidney, right? The stolen kidney story. So, okay, then here's uh, one of the last things I want to talk about this as far as a uh, psychology and sociology angle here. Connie Robinson, a lecturer in the Department of Sociology at CWU, said... Legends help people make sense of things that cannot be explained in other ways. On the website, Mel Waters asserted that mysterious government agents blocked access to Mel's hole and then claimed he was promised a stipend by the government uh, agents if he were to transfer ownership and leave the country, she said. Quote, he could invoke what are called incorrigible propositions. I remember that. That's another great yeah. useful tool in our tool bag okay. here, which is yeah. uh, in, in parentheses here, unquestioned cultural beliefs that cannot be proved wrong no matter what happens to dispute it, end parentheses. She goes on to say, about secret government projects but are reinforced by a socially acceptable distrust of government, she said. Quote, so when other people express doubt about the veracity of his claims, he could point to a government cover-up. Since right. other individuals have expressed distrust of government and concern about quote-unquote secret projects, the absence of scientific proof of the whole then becomes proof of a government conspiracy, she said. There you go. A little bit of circular mojo. She's there. not wrong. No, yeah. that's why I want to mention that. So that quickly, that's just an interesting take on why this story is so popular. And again, folks, sociology is important when looking at this stuff. Now, here comes something that I think is going to be unbelievable by a lot of folks, but to us, divinely fascinating and fun. And my goodness, we wish we could talk to this guy. It's a gentleman who goes by the name of Red Elk. Yes. Now... You can't talk about Mel's Hole without talking about Red Elk. No, because he's kind of, uh, people would say he's latched onto or inserted himself into the story, but but a gentleman going by the name Red Elk called into the Coast to Coast AM show with Art Bell in September of 2008 with a story of his own about Mel's Hole. And he's got a lot of other stories. He's been on Coast to Coast a handful of times, as we said earlier, and uh, it's pretty wild. Now, his connection to Mel's Hole is that uh, he's been at the hole many times since 1961, and he was shown the hole by his father, who had remembered it, right. you know, all the way back from uh, his earliest memories and probably that of the elders, and said that uh, it is a top secret U.S. military base where, quote, alien activities occur. But that's not the end of it. But anyway, that's his connection. And he said he knew where the location was. Now, his real name is Gerald R. Osborne, who used the ceremonial name Red Elk. But instead of letting other people who like to make fun of this kind of stuff describe him, I will read from the bio that is on the Coast to Coast AM webpage, which I would guess that he put there. But here's a description of himself. Red Elk is an intertribal medicine man. He is a self-described half-breed, Native American slash white, of both the Blackfeet and Shoshone nations, as well as part Irish and French. He is a member of the Hyoka Society, a contrarian group of Native Americans who do not follow the normal path of mankind. Red Elk is one of the 12 inner Hyoka members. He is one of the nine members of the Red Web Society who are working to bring understanding of many hidden sacred teachings to the people of Earth. He is also an honorary member of the Cherokee Nation's Twisted Hair Society. 
in 1973, Red Elk went on a 69-day fast, taking water, juices, and vitamins. On or about the 49th day, Red Elk began to experience a vision about the future. For a little more than an hour each day for three days, Red Elk saw and experienced a future that he didn't want to see. The east and west coasts of America subside. A huge meteor strikes the Atlantic. Unimaginably great earthquakes rip apart the earth as massive volcanic eruptions darken the skies and blacken the land. But these tribulations pale in comparison to what soon follows as the earth's axis flips and ensuing floods and 300 mile per hour winds savagely destroy buildings, people, ecosystems, and entire nations. Red Elk believes that there is hope and that we have time to change and prepare. But the first thing we must change is ourselves. Hmm. That's so, uplifting. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, there's there's no shortage of people with that message, let's say. There is a short documentary that's about 12 minutes done by University of Washington communication students with him in it so you can see him talking yeah. and he's got some funny And we'll comments. have a link to it. Yes. But the most recent one, uh, yeah, that was uh, Como TV did a news broadcast segment on him and uh, featured his comments. He claims his dad told him about this thing around 1961 and that it was bottomless then. Once bottomless, always bottomless. <laughs> I mean, your bottomless hole is not suddenly going to have a bottom. <laughs> well, let me put it this way. There is a bottom, but it may not be what you expect. I don't know yeah. how that's going to translate. I'm just saying that, uh, yeah, dead cows and junk are showing up somewhere maybe. Yeah. Or maybe yeah. just out in the middle of space. And uh, that's a it's a good place. If it, if it goes into... Uh, a black hole, okay, you know, at least problem solved. Well, just a couple of things that he would like you to know from his website called Red Elk, one word, dot 50 webs, 50 webs, W E B S dot com. Note to all, this is from his uh, own writing here all medicine people that I personally know, all North and South American, have received the same orders as we 12 inner Hyoka have. Quote, you have one year to prepare. As of June 13th, 2007, all are now going into semi-retirement to prepare ourselves and our families to what will lie ahead at the end of that year. Use this knowledge as you see fit, signed Red Elk. That was 2007. That was 2007. And another note, just a side note here, note to all, I do not represent any Indian nation. I represent only the inner Hyoka society. Our orders do not come from man, but from the creator only. In so doing, many traditional ways are stepped on. If anyone has a complaint, go to the creator and tell him. <laughs> I will continue to do what I and others are ordered. So he has a story, though, that, uh, yes, again, change your ways or bad things are happening. And again, that's not the first. And of course, he is an easy target for ridicule and for connecting his story here. Because he's also talked about uh, Bigfoot, Thunderbirds, Earth Changes. I'm reading on his past shows here from Coast to Coast. Uh, that was September 18th, 2008, 2007, 2005, 2003, 2002. He's been on like, uh, what, six times. And he's always got fascinating and, and startling things to say. But down the bottom of the hole that there are lizard people, the reptilian race down there. Some working in connection with the U.S. government and some that have a deal to do their thing, but also to abuse and use us in limited or unlimited quantities and qualities. And it is something that is connected to what Terry Lovelace has mentioned in his comments. Yeah. Not that he believes that, but that uh, he, I guess you could say he was told that or has heard that. Uh, so... Who knows what to believe? But yes, there's a lot of, uh, you could say, some way out stuff there talked about by Red Elk. Now, his last comments, Red Elk, about the whole Mel's Hole matter is that this will be the last time he takes the media out on Monash Tash Road for an interview about it. And he did not show the TV crew the hole. Now, it's also a knock against him in that there was a group that he took out there, but I don't think he could find the hole, even though he claimed right. to know where it was. But maybe it right. just can't be seen. Uh, so people say, well, there you go. He's just, he's full of it. He doesn't know where it is either. Yeah. And so he ends his talk, I think, on Mel's Hole, at least, or telling people about it. It's far more important to seek your spiritual life. The hole isn't important. Just stay away from trying to find it, said Red Elk 69. The government has it. It's totally off limits. In past interviews, Red Elk has said he has visited the hole several times. It's dangerous, he says. 
He told his own story about Mel's Hole in September 2008 on the late night Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell radio show, and he indicated it led to an underground shadow government facility. He said the hole is carefully camouflaged with a cover to look like the surrounding land so it can't be found. Again, quote, don't look for it. Stay away. I have to say I've been burned by you guys, the media and all, many times with this Mel's Hole. They make me out to be a liar. They say one thing and do something else, Red Elk said recently. But he said, uh, he did say the Como News crew did a good job with the Mel's Hole segment and that they were respectful towards him. So there you go. That's kind of just a little bit about Red Elk, another character surrounding, and, and actually one of the larger, maybe the only one, that has come out and said, I have a connection to this hole and I know where it is. Other people claim that they have found it or are looking for it, but really you don't hear from those folks. Well, folks, that's bringing us to the end of your hole, the endless, never ending hole. Oh. We found the end of it, or well, at least for us. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. In wondering what we think about it and where we're at with it and where you're at with it, it is, it is a somewhat comical story, but it is also an astonishing legend. It's mm -hmm. a perfect story for our kind of show, and we are, again, in deference to Coast to Coast for being the original platform for it. Uh, there's a couple things I would say about it. I mean, one thing that was interesting is early on in one of his early appearances, he's, they both talked about both being Mel and Art. Mm -hmm. The possibility of another pit like this or hole on the uh, Colville Reservation, which is in yes. northeast Washington. Colville, yes. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but that never came up again. Yeah. And I haven't seen anything else about that uh, anywhere else. So, you know, it does make you wonder. It's like, even if this one isn't real, are there things similar that are geological mysteries? Right that aren't really talked about, especially if they're on reservation land, might be kept quiet. So yeah. it's interesting to think that that might be happening up there, but they never brought that up again. There were details that came and went um, in all these different appearances. Yeah, it's like the priest. What did he know? Why did Mel want to get a hold of that uh, Romanian priest? No, Hungarian Catholic priest. There you yes. go. Uh, yeah. yeah, you know, and here's the thing you have to realize, this is all framed in a entertainment show like ours, yes. we can't talk about everything. We're glad when people right. mention stuff we may have forgotten or they know about. That's fine. Right. But we, we can't mention everything. So you yeah. have to kind of pick what you talk about. And that's what art is doing. And that's, I think, what art is known for and what people loved about him is that he was good at just finding those bits and steering a good interview. I couldn't agree more. He was an absolute genius at it. And in the end here, there's a couple of things I did want to point out. This is one thing, you know, we kept talking about that herb. What is this stuff that he's growing or planting? And he never said it, but he said, you know, people could figure it out. And well, guess what? It turns out there is a plant that matches the description of what he was talking about. And it's called Lamadium or mm -hmm. Lamadium dissectum. Yeah. And it's like a, a desert parsley, they call it in a way. And, and it grows exclusively in the area that he was at and in northern Nevada, which is supposedly where the other hole is. Mm -hmm. So that's going on. But then if you go and read about this stuff, I have um, a paper here that was published in the summer of 2012 by a second year student at the University of Nevada School of Medicine. His name is uh, David Prosser. And he wrote this paper and I just wanted to read, he sums it up very well. I was able to corroborate this exact information from multiple sources, but I'm going to read what this section here. Uh, where he talks about Lamadium dissectum. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ernst Krebs, a physician working near Carson City, Nevada, discovered two striking facts concerning the local Washoe Indians. And forgive me if I'm not saying that uh, tribal name correct. Mm. The first was the fact that though members of the tribe had become ill with the virus, and he's speaking specifically of the Spanish flu in this case, mm -hmm. not one member of the tribe died from influenza or its complications. The second was the fact that the tribe had been using the root of the Lamadium dissectum plant to treat those who contracted the illness. Lamadium dissectum, colloquially known as biscuit root, is a rare species of plant in the parsley family that grows in semi-arid climates in the northwest region of the United States and parts of Canada. Up to the time of the flu outbreak, again, we're talking about the Spanish flu, it had been used by the Washoe tribe to treat all fever-causing ailments. The method used by the Washoe tribe to extract the active product used for treatment was peeling the root of the plant, then boiling this root and skimming the oil off the top. Mm. A large dose of broth containing this extract was then given to the patient. One pound of the root was used to produce the medicinal product, and it was given over a three-day period to tribal members that had contracted the Spanish flu. Within one week's time of initiation of the treatment, all patients reportedly had a full recovery. Wow. Mm. Krebs conceded to the fact that the use of the plant 
and the survival of all Washoe tribesmen that were given it as treatment for influenza may have been coincidental. Further supporting the utility of this plant extract in treating influenza, however, was Krebs' report that another physician used it in his practice to treat those infected with influenza that were described as hopeless cases. Mm -hmm. It was found that the treatment of these patients using the extract alone led to a full recovery. Other physicians began catching on and started using preparations of Lamadium dissectum to treat many Caucasians who had contracted the Spanish flu, which they found great success. Krebs even went so far as to describe it as the most effective treatment of that time in treating influenza and any accompanying pneumonia. He praised the plant extract for its versatility, recording that it was more efficacious at treating a cough and longer lasting than the opiate expectorants of the day. He also noted that it was a bronchial, intestinal, and urinary antiseptic, and it also was able to slow the heart rate and lower the blood pressure. Supporting Krebs' assertion that this treatment had great versatility in addition to treating the flu, native tribes used biscuit root for ailments such as the common cold, arthritis, tuberculosis, and rheumatism. So there's more to it than that. We'll have a link to that paper and some other articles about it. I was able then to easily find Lamadium dissectum mm -hmm. for sale as a tincture, an alcohol tincture, mm -hmm. from a brand called Secrets of the Tribe right on the Walmart website. Yeah. So... <laughs> this stuff's still around, folks, and well, it's just quietly yeah. curing the Spanish flu, apparently. And yeah. so what was fascinating to me about, and the reason I wanted to share all this, was because Mel didn't even mention this, but he didn't mention this specific plant, right. but I'm pretty sure it's what he was talking about. And this is a real thing, and it has miraculous qualities, mm -hmm. and it's real. It's a real thing. So... It does make you wonder about some of the other, and why would he say, okay, well, the plants are only growing near these holes. That's mm -hmm. the other thing he implied. Mm -hmm. They're growing near the hole in Nevada, and they're growing near my hole. Mm -hmm. So the plants are growing near Mel's hole. Do with that what yeah. you will. Know. But I, I, I just think <laughs> Mel did. Yeah. it's interesting that right. that's a component of it all. Well, I do wonder in that aspect, though, just as a plant itself, because it was especially effective with respiratory conditions, if it couldn't be applied to... Things we're going through now, and yeah. uh, as far as the common cold. So uh, I'm going to do a little bit more reading on that. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Well, so a couple of other quick observations before we wrap up here. I, you know, there was there was a point at which where the pitch was different between these interviews with Mel, and I thought maybe it was a different person. But as we looked mm -hmm. at them and studied them and took our notes on them, I realized that there were expressions and uh, phrases that he used over and over that reappeared in each of the appearances. So I am fairly right. convinced that all of them are the same person, whoever he is. One of those phrases that he would always say is, I don't have it handy, mm -hmm. which would a lot of times apply to evidence. Uh, he would say, I don't have it handy, I don't have it handy. There was never proof sent in. There were no photos sent in, no pictures of the dime. You can't photograph it. You can't photograph that. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's all pretty fishy stuff. And coming back to outer range, for those of you who have seen that, there's a <laughs> lot of common ground here. Uh, I did look up the creator of outer range because I remember Mel yeah. talking about his nephew was greatly involved in the story and, and mm -hmm. all of these trials and tribulations he went through mm -hmm. over the years. And I was like, what if the creator of outer range is Mel Waters' nephew? And so then wow. I looked him up. His name's Brian yeah. Watkins. What? What? W A T Watkins Waters. Watkins. Yeah. Could mm -hmm. be Brian Watkins. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But well, he's he very is, um, talented. I will yeah, say. he's an incredibly yeah. talented playwright and has just uh, very well respected, has written a lot of work and also created Outer Range. My hat's off to you, sir, if yes, you wind sir. up hearing this. Uh -huh. I'm not convinced that he was inspired by this story. <laughs> no, we don't know. It, he yeah. is very steeped in Western lore. And that's yeah. why his quote opened the show. It, you know, the bottomless pit, it didn't start with Mel's hole, obviously. No, it's, that's what I'm it, saying. It's old as time, as old as people uh, were uh, digging yes. <laughs> or saw animals digging. Or you know what? Uh, that's the one thing is is following an animal's den or hole, and it sparks wonder. Like if you've ever seen uh, chipmunks or squir ground squirrels right. or gophers, and you just wonder, like, how far does that go down? Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's just, it just, it's a very elemental thing to the human imagination. So uh, no wonder it's captured all of ours. I want to leave it with one last observation. And that's with uh, a, about a man that we've mentioned on the show before, Jan Harold Brunvand, mm -hmm. who is considered in a lot of ways the father of the urban legend. He was an educator on this. He is a folklorist, researcher, writer, public speaker, professor emeritus of English at the University of Utah. So he's in the neighborhood here. He actually yeah. lives in Salt Lake City. He was born in 1933. He'd be about Mel's age, by the way. 
yeah. hear, I'd like to hear his voice on tape, see if he yeah. was Mel. Uh, that was yeah. the other thing we looked at was we did look, <laughs> I did look to see if Kurt Vonnegut was maybe doing it. Right. I looked at some, uh, and <laughs> be, honestly, the voices yeah. were similar, but it just, it yeah, didn't that's seem, true. Right. Didn't seem right, but yeah. No, my favorite uh, uh, Vonnegut, uh, it, I, I like only compared to was his appearance in uh, Rodney Dangerfield's Back to School, where yeah. he's, he's rich enough to have Kurt Vonnegut <laughs> do a paper on his own subject. Yes, right, right. And That's then he gets nice. a D. It's hilarious. <laughs> he gets a yeah. D for... Gets a D. Uh, yeah, commenting on his own stuff, which that makes sense. Well, Mr. Brunbond yeah. wrote an article back in 1989. This is March 10th of 1989. This appeared in the Deseret or Deseret News. I'm not sure how mm-hmm. they pronounce that in Utah, forgive mm-hmm. me. But I want to just read this as a very short little article because this is what Mel's Hole reminded me of. Are people in Australia and Texas pulling my leg? I began to wonder when two versions of the same story arrived in my mail within a week of each other. Here's the Aussie version sent by folklorist David S. Holtz of the Curtin University of Technology in Perth. Quote, A young girl was in line behind an elderly woman at a supermarket checkout counter. The woman stared at the girl and eventually said, Please pardon my staring, but I can't believe it. You're the spitting image of my dead daughter. The woman then asked, I know this sounds strange, but when I leave the store, could you say goodbye to me and call me mom as a reminder of my daughter? The girl, slightly embarrassed, agreed. And as the woman departed, the girl waved and said, Goodbye, mom. Then the checkout clerk told her that the total bill for her groceries was $67.45. The girl was stunned since she was only buying a loaf of bread and some milk. But your mother, who just left, said you would pay for her groceries, too, Uh. the clerk explained. (laughs) Now, readers might recognize this as the legend that I call the grocery scam, but the Down Under version concludes differently than the versions I'd collected from the U.S. and Canada. Quote, the girl ran outside the supermarket to nab the phony mother and force her to explain and to pay for her own groceries. The girl yeah. caught up with the woman in the parking lot just as she was getting into her car to drive off. The girl grabbed her leg and tried to pull her from the car. She pulled and she pulled and she pulled and... And at this point, the listener to the story usually says something like, good grief, what happened? And the reply is, well, she was pulling her leg just like I'm pulling yours. <laughs> hey, didn't uh, you have, a, didn't you have a, a relative that would employ that same kind of joke structure. Yes, he told that joke. joke it was math. in a grocery store, and I think the guy goes up through the ceiling, and there's leg pulling. So, And it, right, I guess right. uh, Brunvon calls this the catch tail. There's more that he lists in this article. We'll put a link to the article. but It's for also me, the paper moon scam. Yeah, right? it's the paper he, moon scam. You write scam. down happy birthday on the 20, and uh, she, the girl starts crying. It's like, no, no, I, that, that, you know, I got a 20 on my birthday, and he has to make change. Right, yeah. It's not impossible. Like I said, like that might be a pulling your leg joke, but like I believe that. Hey, there's a guy on camera using, I believe, um, East Indian mesmer techniques to fool a cashier out of uh, out of the cash in the in the register. Yeah, yeah. I guess for me, when I step back and and gaze into Mel's hole, oof. Yeah. I think my final thoughts are that I think it's a well perpetrated hoax. I think mm. it's just absolutely too absurd. Really, I think it's either that or it's a legitimate. And I said this earlier: disinformation campaign, expertly crafted by PSYOPs to conceal something that is similar and of significance to the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about like a pie-eyed conspiracy here. I'm talking about the practicality of keeping something real quiet by masking it in absurdity. That has happened. Right. Those are the only two things for me. I don't think any of this is what it seems. It's either complete baloney or it's covering up something not so spectacular, nevertheless important. Well, I don't know about you, man, but I look at every possible combination stemming from the three logical points. Either it's all true, it's all false, or it's a combination of both. Little from column A, little from column B. Because there are some elements that are fantastical, but when it starts off, the story itself isn't that fantastical. It just could be a misunderstanding by Mel, who self-admittedly says, I'm not a geologist, I don't... You know, I don't know anything about this. I might be making a mistake as far as how far down it goes. We thought that theory might be possible too. Yeah, he might just be mistaken that it's balmous, but it's deep. It's a deep mind shaft of some kind. And maybe that's deep enough to, like I said, I don't know if it's 300 feet deep as the working gold mine theory by Jack Powell states. Yeah. Who knows how long it would take over the years to fill that up, you know, where people, it would stink, I would imagine. 
Yeah. But like I told you before, out in Mojave here, they're using a, a, an abandoned mine shaft to shove a lot of L.A. garbage in there, right? Right. And that's going to, I mean, they liked it because it's solid rock. It's not going to seep. And uh, it's uh, just as good as paving over it, making a water park over it. You know, that's not impossible. Other theories, just quickly over here, and these can be found again on ratingoaks.com, the blog website of Christopher Hayden. Uh, he just sums them up here. These are the most popular ones, of course, is a volcanic cave or a lava tube. And he just has a description here, we'll, which we will post. That's from Encyclopedia Britannica and that uh, they don't go that deep. As Jack Powell himself says in that little short documentary from uh, UW, communication students is that it's basically plumbing for a volcanic system. They don't go straight down. They're not that deep. And uh, they're just, uh, you know, the lava tubes develop here. It says, eh, best in highly fluid lava, notably a basaltic type known as pahoho. I'm not making that up. <laughs> so it, it, the idea, though, is that, yeah, that's a good idea. I mean, I, when I first heard the story, I thought myself, too, is that, well, if there is, is any kind of a hole, it's going to be maybe a geologic anomaly that is tied to a vent tube from Mount Rainier, perhaps, something close by. Uh, other geological possibilities are small caves, pressure ridge caves, spatter cone chambers, blister caves. None of these really fit the description of Mel's Hole. Here's one, the Shaver Mysteries that people are going to, I know, email us about, and the Hollow Earth Theory. Yes. That's a whole other topic or two or three on its own. Not going to get into it here, but just that uh, it's another realm. Uh, another theory, government project or slash weaponry, that it's uh, some kind of earth weapon with using the uh, either something buried underground in a facility, as Red Elk claims, or something utilizing and enhancing or synergistically co-opting the powerful energies emanating from the center of the earth, which we know they're very powerful, right? That it's basically some kind of military operation, or at least it was found out about and then co-opted and is now, uh, there's weapon testing and it's going to be like the mist and unleash a, a hell's fury of all kinds of unsavory beasts and creatures and insects that like to eat people alive. And then the last one is that it's just some type of a, a natural or natural formation we just don't know about. It's just there. There's something, uh, keeping it from collapsing in on itself, as Jack Powell says. As for myself, look, man, I don't know. It, <laughs> here's the deal. It's a cool story. It's the stuff that we love to hear about on coast to coast. It sparks the imagination, like I said, the bottomless pit is supposed to. And going back to your idea, is it an impossible story covering or misdirecting an impossible event or feature or weapon or some kind of phenomena that is real, but you're using an impossible story to cover that. You know, I mean, as far as all the, the logical permutations, right, of the equation, fantastical story covering something mundane, but you just don't want people to know about it. It has to do with the Yakima firing range, whatever. Or it starts off as a mundane story covering something mundane or it's made up. Or like I said, the, the fun part is the fantastical story covering up and misdirecting for something that's even more outrageous. And that is the U.S. government military working with a reptilian underground race or some kind of crazy weapon. So I don't know, but it's all these elements which make it fun. Like I said, it's, and I say that because it starts off is not that unbelievable. It's fantastical, but over a course of four years or more, it builds and not all at once. It, it's, there's big time gaps of years it starts off just exactly the right way for a good finish. You know what I'm saying? It's, it was well done all along. And that you don't start off with a whiz-bang and get even, even crazier is that you seed it along. And guess what? We all went along for the ride. And we still are. So, in conclusion, fact, fiction, a combination of both, I don't know. But every element of the legend of Mel's Hole, all of it, makes for an astonishing legend that that's it you're done oh well usually you, you you cut to music when i utter a line like that towards the end oh so you have more to say all right I, I, one more thought i think maybe just maybe this theory of mine will explain the entire thing oh and this is what i think <laughs> Thank you. 
that's going to wrap up our series on Mel's Hole. We'll be back in two weeks with a new episode. Visit patreon.com slash astonishinglegends to access our exclusive junk drawer show that runs every week the main show is dark, which means patrons can hear Astonishing Legends year-round. Please remember to support our sponsors. They help keep the show free and the lights on in Blanket Fortiana. P-O-O. I'm Aubrey Playtech. S-A-M. Galaxy-wide in perpetuity. L-I-E-K. Astonishing Legends is edited by Sarah Voorhees Wendell at VW Sound and co-produced by Tess Feifel, who is also head of research and the social media manager. Special thanks to our announcer, John Bolin. Our theme, which is available as a ringtone, was composed by Judson Crane at foundermusic.com, and our sound design and additional composing is by Ryan McCullough. Our logo was created by Tommy Beaver Design, and our animated graphics for social media and YouTube are done by Joshua Sloan at deadstreetproductions.com. Every episode going back to September of 2020 has a transcription available on its corresponding webpage at our website. Earlier transcriptions can be made available upon request to astonishingcontact at gmail.com. Astonishing Legends would not be possible without you, our listeners. Visit our store at astonishinglegends.com or interact with us and other listeners on Instagram, Twitter, Discord, Facebook, and YouTube. You can also visit us at patreon.com slash astonishinglegends, where patrons have access to additional bonus content, including the Patreon-exclusive show, Astonishing Junk Drawer, which is available every week the main show is not. No part of this show may be reproduced anywhere without permission. Copyright Astonishing Legends Productions. Good night. <laughs>